Boy, man, I know a lot of people watched last night's fights. Um, I've been getting messages from friends and old coaches uh, and, you know, things of that nature. of Just like, man, what a knockout. Oh, man, Lewis, this, you know, and I love that. That is literally the whole reason I essentially started this podcast was I wanted a community of people that was excited the day after fights to talk about what transpired. And, and I feel like we're kind of heading in that direction with Beefy Nation. And I love everybody that's a part of a part of it and watches and comments and texts me. And just, yeah, man, feel free to reach out. Even if, you know, we're not super close, feel free to shoot me a DM at Dreadful Talk Dom. Hey, man, did you see the fights last night? Or what did you think about this? I love, you know, engaging with people, talking about fights. But uh, let's get my beefy brother Harrison on here with us, and let's get this episode underway. Let's see. Make sure I'm on the right notes here. There we go. Episode 36. Let's get it, baby. Hey, what's up? What up, bro? And we are officially underway with episode 36 of BP Boys Breakdown, man. And uh, like I said, I was talking a little bit on the intro it just about how, you know, I'm starting to get more and more people reaching out to me, tweeting me, texting me, DMing me, just like, oh, did you see the knockout? What did you think of the yeah. this and that? And that's the best feeling in the world, bro. Like I said, that's kind of essentially the whole, if you, I mean, I think I've always found the, word mission statement to be a little corny but it's just like that's what we're doing here right like we want yeah. to create like a community of mma fans that you know just the day after fights have all these emotions and thoughts and uh, of what they just what witnessed transpire and they want to engage with and talk about it and see if other people feel the same way they did man that's literally what we're doing here on bb boys breakdown not to mention like just how how unexpected some of those results are in fighting i feel like and I mean, I know we talk about this all the time, but it's just one of those things, man, where like the ability for a kick or a knee or a punch or an elbow to like literally change the entirety of a fight. I mean, it's just not like that in any other sport, man. You don't get a fast break dunk that changes the entirety of a basketball game. Yeah, but, you don't but, get a, a, a breakaway running touchdown usually in the first quarter that changes the whole football game. Yeah, yeah, like like in football, a touchdown is worth six, and then in basketball, it's either going to be worth two or three. Like there's no, there's right. no like, like, or like, the, the only sport that can compare to mixed martial arts is a fictional sport, Quidditch. And if you yeah, the game golden snitch, snitch it's over. <laughs> uh, that, that's, like a, that's like watching a Derek Lewis fight, for real. Probably the first person to ever compare a Derek Lewis fight to Quidditch. But hey, that's what, you come here to, uh, for the quality, unique takes on BP Boys Breakdown. But uh, hey, Bryce, I want to do something real quick. Yeah. It sounds like you, you can hear me just fine right now, right? Yeah. Okay, I want to try the headphones and tell me if it's better or worse or whatever. I've been having some weird audio issues lately. Like I did a whole episode of Dreadful Talk, and none of my guests' audio came through. It was a fucking yeah. I nightmare. saw that. It's super unfortunate too, because like you said, like you can't have that conversation again. Like no, it just wouldn't be organic or real. It wouldn't be organic. It would. It would be forced. Yeah, I said maybe, maybe a few months down the road, maybe something else to talk about. Whatever we can try to get them back on, but it is unfortunate because that's the best part about podcasting, right? The the authenticity, the kind of the real the, feel, the, the realness, the in the moment, real conversation, unscripted nature. Of it. That's what made podcast podcast. So, yeah, that was unfortunate. So, here, tell me how this sounds better, worse, whatever. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Cool. Right. Is anything right, different, better, worse? No, it's honest. I mean, I think it's a little better, honestly. Kind of captures okay. the sound a little, a little more like precisely, I think. Sweet, sweet. So we'll keep it. We'll keep it pushing with the headphones in. Um, anybody watching? Yeah, if you can't hear Dmac, please comment. Yeah, yeah. If you can't hear us, if you can't hear either one of us, for those watching on live right now on Facebook Live, please comment. Let us know. Because like I said, I'm I'm a little gun shy right now. I did an amazing <laughs> podcast. Shout out to homie Bo Bradshaw. You know, he's coaching a uh, defense over at Carl Albert High School, and you know we had a dude. Had they're a good so play. good. They just won state like what four years in a row or something. Their quarterback is a beast. Yeah, yeah. He was talking. We talked all about that shit. Though just lost. Yeah. To the, lost to the oh, you know, archives of time, man. But man. We're here to talk, you know, we're here to talk fights. We're here to talk last night's fights in particular. We had great UFC card. Vegas. Yeah, man, great, Bro, great card. I, I don't know how you felt about this one in, as an entirety or as a whole, but, like, I remember last week you had said that 
underpromised, over delivered was the theme of last week. I, I think that's more true with this week, to be quite honest. I had no expectations for this card. And honestly, like even the main event, the odds were so disrespectful. They felt accurate, but they were so disrespectful. And, and we'll get to that. We'll get to, you know, the clairvoyant cattle over here making making boss-ass predictions. Hey, anytime, anytime you cash anything over plus 300, you, you had an insight that Vegas had no idea about. For sure, man. Yeah, we'll get into that. Like I said, I don't know. I was I was looking forward to last night's cards because, like I said, we we've been we've been talking about this kind of heavyweight Grand Prix that's kind of shit taking yeah. place and shaping up, and and this is gonna you know this week and next week is gonna you know it's gonna play out essentially before our eyes and, and kind of clarify the picture a little bit more. Um, and yeah, we'll get into all that big picture heavyweight talk. Um, but yeah, so last night I'll be real as far as expectations for the card goes, I. I, I was so focused on the the quantity that I didn't even really get to focus on, like, the quality. Like, I think there was originally going to be 17 fights on this card, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. at the and very I, top, when they booked all the fights, they had 17 fights booked out for this. Crazy. Insane, insane. That's why I was uh, – because for those that don't know, sometimes Harrison has to watch the fights, like, after work, and he works at a restaurant and bar. So, you know, sometimes he's starting the fights at midnight. And I was like, God, Harrison's <laughs> going to be awake until, like, 2 p.m. the next day watching all these fucking <laughs> fights. But, uh, but man, so I was focused on the quantity. Now, they are getting smarter. It's almost guaranteed that you can almost set your watch to it that at least two of the fights are going to fall out due to either COVID, injuries, this, that, the other – so I feel like they intentionally are starting to like overbook these cards. That way the yeah. cabinet's not bare whenever a couple of the cards get pulled. And you so know what like, though, man? I kind of like that plan. Like a whole lot. Like the UFC's never done it like that until COVID came around. Like they used to pretty much force guys out there. Like, I don't care if you're hurt or not. Like get out there, like <laughs> get, you know, like we got a deal. But now it's to the point where it seems more professional. Like if there's something that goes wrong, they are ready and willing to like fix or remove that fight. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's, it's not like you're really going to run into the scenario of, like, too many fights. Like, because, I mean, some at some point on the card, there's going to be a first-round finish. And, you know, that you, so I feel like it's real easy to kind of shuffle those times around last night. I feel like last night, because of how many cards were pulled, though, yeah, I feel like there were definitely some stalling moments in the broadcast. But uh... Oh, dude, I caught those. <laughs> and, like, I was fast-forwarding, but I definitely caught those. There was one where I think it was about two hours into the prelims. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense from the first four finishes or five fights. Yeah. The first is the way the first five went. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but speaking of stalling, <laughs> let's dive into these prelims, dog. Yeah, we got, a, yeah. We got a Sergey Spivak coming in at minus two forty favorite fighting uh, Jared. I'm gonna say Vanderall. I, I I think that's how you say that. Uh, plus two hundred underdog starting the night off with heavyweights. Like I said, the theme of the night was heavyweights. Um, pretty much the whole re point of the card was to kind of get some clarity in the heavyweight division. So why not start the card off with some heavyweights, man? Uh, it, was, it was a good time. A lot of heavyweight fights in this card. I, mean, I think we had four or five total, which was sick. I love watching the heavyweights fight. And there's, it's not that big of a division. So when you and, see and this I'll many, it's, it's nice. It's rare. All, all the heavyweights we watched last night, there wasn't one quote-unquote fat guy. They were all athletes. No. Yeah. They were it's a great, that's a great like, point. That's a great zero, point. Guess, zero moves on the heavyweight card. The thickest guys are probably Bandera or, or Lewis. And shout out to Derek Lewis, by the way. We'll definitely get to this. But his physique is changing. Like, he's putting the work in the gym. I appreciate uh -huh. that. 100%, man. But, yeah, man, and we, we, we did, we've done a few Sergey Spivak uh, fights, you know. And he he's looking like a nice, you know, up-and-coming heavyweight. And so, you know, he was definitely on the radar. Um, man, in round one. I got to go 10-9 speed back. Um, he had two takedowns, some nice ground and pound. But the only thing that kept it from being a 10-8, not a lot of damage, especially when we're talking. Yeah, Vendera just kind of, I mean, I, I'm not saying shelled up, but had such a good uh, ability to cover himself up on the ground and, and just keep speed back in a neutral position, almost in top control, that it was a 10-9 for sure for speed back. But, yeah, I, I couldn't see a 10 -8. Dude, also, speaking of 10-8s, Bisping was getting wild with his 10-8s last night. <laughs> wild. <laughs> We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Hell yeah. I got to say, though, I, I do like I, – I, I'll take Bisping over Cruz on the call yeah. any fucking day of the yeah. week. Bisping, Dude. I feel like it's the most hate online and this and that. And, and I guess I don't mind it that much. And I'm not trying to be a hater, but was it not the most B squad production team you've ever seen? Brendan Fitzgerald, just Bisping on the mic, uh, and then Joe Martinez is our announcer. Like, are you shitting me? Like, not only did you pull one of our commentators, but now I have Joe Martinez talking to me. 
Yeah, yeah, it's like I love Rashad Evans as a fighter, but like as a commentator, it doesn't necessarily bring them or as an analyst doesn't bring the most. So like him and Joe Bond talking about B squad, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh dude. They had some funny production mistakes too, but we'll get back we'll get back to those. We'll get we'll give Sergey Speed back his time. He deserves it. Yeah. Uh, man, definitely. definitely. So we both had it first first round ten nine. Uh, I'd say the second round, even more dominant for Spivak. Kind of, it was almost like he experienced, like, in the first round, like, oh, this is what I need to do to win. And then second round came out and was like, I'm going to win now. That's oh, kind yeah, of how oh, I saw yeah. it. Round two, I was, like, getting ready to write, like, 10-8 question mark, and then the fight yeah. was over. Like, like right now, because it was, it, was, it was on its way to a 10-8. Spivak oh, yeah. really kind of took over, dominated. Um, yeah, thought- he, he was able to finish him off with the ground and pound TKO. I, I got to ask a question, and it's all, it's like impossible to answer with kind of the wishy-washy stoppages nowadays. But too like, late. It was too late. It was way too late. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote, finally, Jesus Christ, Tonyoni. That was my final note on this fight. Like, yeah, it, it, dude, no, I, was out of line last night. He was out yeah. of line. Out of line. Slapping <laughs> fighters' hands, yelling, getting way too close. He was out of line. Herb Dean, always out of line. Honestly, the only good refs in the card last night were Mark Smith and Jason Herzog. Yeah, and I think even Bisbee had something to say about Mark Smith at one point, and I kind of disagreed with. But but I also love that Bisbee was calling out. Um, who did you just say? Who was who was the rep on this fight? Uh, Tonyoni. Tonyoni. Yeah, Bisbee was calling the Tonyoni. <laughs> yeah, he was like Tonyoni doing his most to be a part of this fight tonight. <laughs> yeah. And, like, it's a silent arena. You can definitely, like, hear him say that, which, which is, I think is real. It's not like you're saying it behind his back, you know what I mean? That's kind of realize that I, That's the kind of stuff I like this being does. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I wanted to bring up the fact, kind of a late stoppage, but here's how my fucked up brain works. It's like, man, I've seen so many bitch-ass early stoppages. And I, <laughs> yeah. can, I can use the late stoppage every now and again. <laughs> Sorry, Vander Ross. Sorry, you had to – Pay the toll for that, uh, but I was like, it's like, yeah, my knee, my knee jerk reaction was like kind of a late stoppage, but like you know, with all the early stoppages, you know. It's not I think we had, I think we had one more fight tonight that was a uh, questionably late stoppage. Yeah, but I will say that the reason being is you couldn't have stopped it any sooner. <laughs> fair, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. But we'll keep it, uh, we'll keep it pushing to this next fight. Um, next fight, first upset of the night, we got um. Alan yeah. Zahabi, which is the brother of uh, – his name's Faraz Zahabi. Faraz Zahabi, coach, GSP's uh, yeah. coach. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, MMA, you know, well-respected in the MMA community, for sure, legend. Uh, so we got his brother, Alaman Zahabi, as a plus-160 underdog, fighting Draco Rodriguez, minus-190. And I don't know, man, Draco Rodriguez may need, need to start a rap career because like, I don't know if that, that's like – What a sick rapper, name. Man. Yeah. yeah Dr- Draco Rodriguez is like, man, I can just see the mixtape art now, you know. Uh, but uh, but, but I mean, you know, it was a good fight. Uh, we got a bantamweight matchup, so um, you know, with all the big guys fighting, you know, it's nice to kind of mix it up a little bit. Bantamweight one thirty five. We always talk about how loaded that division is, and this is a prime example of it because both of these guys yeah. are really good fighters. Neither of these guys were ranked. And in all fairness, it's not like the winner will probably be ranked even after this because that division gets so damn packed. So uh, and gotta shout love out, ways. Shout out to Zahabi too, man. Hasn't fought in two years. This is the last fight on his UFC contract tonight, so or last night. So he probably would get cut if he loses this. And he's the underdog, so it's almost like they expect him to lose and get cut. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I feel like they were definitely trying to hype up, uh, you know, Draco a little bit. And um, yeah, um, Draco Dan White Contender is- Series. What do you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Wow, I didn't even put two and two together, but yeah, it's like I'm not. It just kind of like, yeah, of course, like that's par for the course, right? You give but, him a uh, Zah- you give him the name Zahabi because he's from DWCS. It's like, okay, cool, that's fair. Yeah, man. And then, um, so so and then uh, D Rob did miss weight. He weighed in at one forty point five, which is a lot to miss weight by. I mean, that's almost the featherweight. Four, you know four and a half, saying? four and a half pounds. Yeah, he was, yeah. he was closer to featherweight than he was to bantam. Yeah, yeah, so that's always questionable, and, you know, uh, call it karma, call it what you will, you know, or call it a, <laughs> call it a tough, call it a tough weight cut is probably more scientifically accurate, but, uh, you know, he, he paid the price for it, because it, first round TKO, and, um, man, it yeah. was just like, it was like, you know, sub third round finishes back to back, I was like, oh, we got ourselves a card here, boys, um, and, uh, you know, it was a fun way to start the night, for sure, two finishes back to back. Um, but yeah, Zahabi caught him with the right hand and just put him down. Um, 
I thought he broke it down beautifully in his post fight interview too. Whenever yeah. Bisping asked him, like, "Hey, go through it," and he was like, "Well, I was just timing out his hands, seeing who was faster." And he was like, "Once I decided that I was faster, he was like, that just equals me throwing a counter because I have the speed advantage." So I tried it and it worked. And it was like, that's simply simply put, but also beautifully put. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. It's it's like fighting is one of those weird things where like both things can be true. On one hand, it's like a super nuanced, like uber technical, complicated chess match. And on one hand, it's the simplest thing mankind have been doing since we figured out how to shit and fuck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like so, so it's like this weird kind of dynamic between the like hyper complex and the you know uber simple kind of. It, like both can be true at the same time when it comes to this you know wonderful sport. Um, and yeah, man. So it's a hobby, you know. Like like you said, pretty much keeps his career alive. It seems like. Um, also gets the 50G performance of the night bonus, which with all of the crazy finishes, I thought that was, you know, kind of, I don't want to say he got lucky. He without a doubt earned it, but like there was a lot of good finishes last night and for him to get the performance of the night bonus, you know, I think it says a lot. Okay. So I don't know the bonuses. So I'll just let you tell me as we go. Cause I don't want you to tell me now cause I'll give away some results, but yeah, yeah. I have an idea of who it would be. And I thought he would be one. And I think between the Landweir Erosa fight, one of those guys got it. Uh, well, obviously the winner. I just don't want to say who it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll get there. But yeah, we'll I get think, there. I, th I think I the think people that wrong. got put. I think <laughs> the people, oh, I, I think <laughs> the people that got put fully out last night should be the ones that, or their opponent rather, should be the one that gets the bonus, in my opinion. Like, like for instance, Zahabi like put Rodriguez out. Like he was on the ground underdog. out. And he was an underdog. That's a great point. Like, there's both reasons why he should get a bonus over someone else doing it. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, sure, I felt like sure. the highlight of it, just one shot, boom, down on the ground. And the dude's mouth was, like, he was flexing his, like, biting down so hard that his, his lip came up and you could see his mouthpiece and his eyes were, like, staring down at the canvas. It was pretty scary. No, it was a nice knockout for sure. So, yeah, Zahabi got the performance of the night bonus. Um, We'll keep it pushing because this next little situation here can't even really call it a fight, but uh, this next Beefy little, Boys first. Yeah, what happened next was a Beefy Boys first, as you said. Uh, so Chaz Kelly was scheduled to fight Jamal Emmers. Um, Kelly was Kelly was the underdog at plus two hundred, and so so usually the underdog comes out to the cage first, and yep. um, and Skelly so he makes his walk, walk out music, walking out, feeling himself. He gets in the cage, kind of does a little lap around the cage. You know, how fighters do. He's like getting ready to go, and then there's just like this awkward. The best way I can compare it to is like in like the dramatic rom com movies when they like rush at the last minute to break up the wedding, and people are like whispering yeah. and it, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so just like that. Yeah. What happened. <laughs> Or like when the Thunder Jazz game got canceled and you saw like a medical team official run out. It's almost so – it's it's surreal. It doesn't yeah, like feel it, real. It's surreal. And it's something that doesn't happen, so there's not really like a protocol a precedent. in place. Yeah. yeah. So um, it just seemed kind of haphazard and last minute and like, oh, shit. And so essentially what I'm getting at here is, so like I said, after Chaz Kelly – has, has already made his walk. That's what makes this unique. Fights get scratched the last minute, like, all the time. But uh, Ch Chaz Skelly had already made his walk and was in the cage and, and all that. And uh, Like, and essentially, then, by like, that point, Ember should be in the locker room. Like, everyone's standing up waiting to walk out the door. Like, they're just waiting for him to say his name. Literally. And then, and then like I said, yeah, you see, a, you see like, a doctor or a um, – I don't know if there's a doctor. Uh, Nevada or State a, Athletic State. Commission official, yeah. For sure, yeah, that, that's what I was going to say next. And uh, you see, so you see somebody run out, and then, like I said, whisper in somebody's ear, and then they call the ref over, and then they call the fighter over, and then you see the fighter's reaction. And He's like, what? what? The fuck? And, like, at that point, you can kind of gather what's happening. You're like, did this fight just get caught? And um, it's, I it's, thought maybe it's, his opponent passed out or something like that, you know? Like, when you actually get down to the reason, and I don't want to, like, speak ill on it, but, like, back spasms end up being the reason that Emmers is locked up in his room and can't like make it to the octagon yeah yeah back spasms super weird. Like I said I would have you know been willing to bet my left nut it was essentially COVID related or weight cut related yeah. one of those two and More I like guess an maybe, yeah yeah and I guess maybe back spasms could be weight cut related because I think like dehydration yeah, the muscle yeah hands, like affect that well, and, and, so this actually hit me in like a weird way uh so I recently, very, very recently, was dealing with bad back spasms, bro. Like my really? whole lat, 
was fucking twitching. Like, have you ever been hooked up to like a like I think it's called a stem machine that does like a little yeah, and it, shot. like you'll and just like see it'll your make arm your like bicep flex. like jumping, bro. Yeah. That's what my whole right lat felt like. Like my shoulder blade, like like it was just like literally twitching and tweaking Damn. and bouncing, and it was so painful. I was essentially bedridden for like three days. So that's what and, I was gonna ask you is like what were like how like how does how how could you could you physically perform when that's striking you? No way. Well, I, I, I would have, like, in that pain, I would have literally got beat up by, like, a teenager at that moment. Like, like, and so part part of me is the same thing as you. Is like, oh, that's a really strange reason to scratch a fight this late. But, like I said, this literally just happened to me, like, a week or two ago. And, and I mean, it, it's essentially debilitating, man. Like, it, it, it like. I it, believe it. Because, like, it, Bisping. A, yeah. He spoke to it. He was like, yeah, you know, I've been there. Like, I actually can understand. He was like, that's really unfortunate. He was like, that just happens. He was like, it's just really unfortunate that happened right now. You know what's funny about that happening is when Derek Lewis fought in Ganu and everyone trashed that fight and talked about, oh, that was a terrible fight. Derek Lewis was having awful lower back spasms that night and said he barely wanted to walk out, but he was like, I couldn't let the fans down. So that's he fought, one. yeah, he fought Francis Ngannou with back spasms like that for us. Yeah, no, and that's why, and that's why the fans love Derek Lewis. I mean, Derek Lewis, like I said, even if he would have lost last night, he'd still be a draw. He'd still be a fan yep. favorite. I mean, he he he's a. It's cool too because, especially nowadays, with everybody putting so much emphasis on their marketing and social media presence and all that, and they're outside of the octagon like persona, which more power to him. I love that part of the game. But what I'm saying is. Derek Lewis is just as famous for inside the octagon performances as, as outside. For like one line of like one liners and interviews and, and all that stuff. So that's what that's what's awesome about Derek Lewis. But we'll we'll definitely get to the Derek Lewis nut ride hour, you know. As <laughs> you. Um, but man, next uh, I'll, I'll let you introduce this one because I know how you have a, I know how you feel about one of these yes, fighters. And so I, 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 I can't I can't talk to talk how you're going to introduce this. So go ahead, brother. So, at women's 125, very open division, so I was really happy to see this result. Uh, we have Casey O'Neill. She was 5-0 and coming in out of Australia. She's this Scottish girl that moved down there, young, younger in her life, 10 years old or so, and has been training there since. Also kind of hot. Um, <laughs> she was minus 160 against uh, Shauna Dobson, who is 4-4. Four and four, Not UFC record. That's her MMA record. Uh, yeah. at, that's embarrassing. At plus 135. And uh, just... Just for anyone at home that wants to, like, is wondering, yeah, I'm biased. My first notes were, I hate Shauna Dobson. Literally first notes. That's so, like literally, like, what, that's all I let you to do is this one, man, at home. I was like, oh, man, here's it against Stan Shauna Dobson. And, man, it's warranted. Like, you're judging her off her merit. Like, there's She's just boring no, in the octagon. Well, and, like, your record is your record, bro. Like, there's not another division in all of uh, mixed martial arts other than the UFC women's flyweight division where you would even be allowed in the octagon with a 500 record. Literally, like, any other division. Yeah, bro. Any other division. Like, they're, that division's so thin. We, we've talked about it ad nauseum. Uh, we've – the division's so thin, and they just essentially need bodies. And Dobson is game and can win and can beat people. So they throw her in there with people. And, yeah, she, she's a card filler. You know what I'm and, saying? I mean, to be fair to her, like the one thing I will say in her defense is she does have the biggest upset in UFC history as far as betting lines are concerned. Yeah. So, and she has power. Like, she hits hard. She has power. And, like, she is strong in the standing clinch. Yeah. But what was awesome to me last night was as soon as O'Neal got the takedown, O'Neal got – or Dobson got back up quickly and then got Matt returned, and O'Neal was in control from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, I, I thought round one was way closer than it was going to be because, like you, you know, I wasn't expecting much out of Dobson. But at the start of round one, Dobson was landing some heavy shots on O'Neal. Mm -hmm. Like, she was connecting. She was connecting very hard and very clean. Um, I, you know, obviously O'Neal was able to, you know, deal with it and adjust and kind of turn it more into grappling. Uh, but man, on the feet, man, uh, Dobson was giving her, you know, all she could, all she could bargain for. You know, you said, granted, it is her debut. I think she was 23 years old, and Dobson, you know, has been in, the, been at it a lot longer. But uh, yeah, I still gave round one 10-9 O'Neal because at the end of round one, O'Neal really started to take over with the grappling and the ground and pound and took 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 control of the. Round. I won't even say stole the round. Took control of the round. Yeah, and I will say for Shauna Dobson, in her defense, once one more time, 
she had some good damage she was landing in the transition from when she was getting taken down the first two times. But, yeah, man, other than that, I thought it was Casey O'Neill pretty much for the last three minutes and 30 seconds of the round. Oh, yeah. And, and once again, anybody watching live, if you can't hear any of our mics, please let us know. Said, I'm still a little paranoid. I had a technical difficulty happen recently, and it got me gunshots. Just leave us a comment. Let us know that you can hear both me and Harrison's mics. But, um, but yeah, man, I feel you. Um, and then in round two, Casey O'Neill. So in round one, it was a feeling out. Casey O'Neill established the path to the victory. It was most likely going to be through ground and pound. And then in and, and round two, she came out and just continued down that road, executed the game plan, and, and was able to get the ground and pound finish. Um, second round TKO, like I said, this, these prelims were full of, uh, I mean, relatively fast finishes. I mean, there's sub-third round finishes. And, uh, you know, as, as that's what you want from prelims, right? Like, nobody wants a bunch of decisions in prelims. So, uh, they were getting after it. It was entertaining, and it was it was free. And, yeah, and, so uh, – And as a prelim fighter, man, that's the best way for you to make your name and get to main cards is put highlights up. 100%, 100%. And then, you know, obviously they can, you can still win a 50 Gs even if you're on the prelim. So, you know, it's – Yeah. Like, and now that's not what happened here. O'Neal did not get a performance of the night bonus. But she did get a nice win. Like I said, you can, you can question the um, caliber of the opponent. But it was her debut. Um and she right. looks to be an impressive young prospect. And, and we've, like I said, we've, we've hammered this point into the ground. But in women's flyweight, it's so thin that rapid ascensions can happen. So We need the blood a, there. Whenever you see a 23-year-old undefeated prospect come in and get a win, I mean, it's really – because sometimes I let, like, you know, my projections for these fighters get – it's fun to kind of, you know, be optimistic in your projections. I'll admit that. But in Absolutely. women's flyweight, like, really, like, the dead ass the skies is the limit until you have to fight Shevchenko. Like, I know. It's, it's like it's, she's it's, guarding the gates. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, man. It's insane that 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 division is so up for grabs until you get to the champion. Until like, the number one contender spot is completely up for grabs for any of these girls. The except, belt, however. <laughs> yeah, the belt's a little harder to grab. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a crazy weird division. Like I said, not. Not our favorite division, but Casey O'Neill may may give us a reason to watch. You know, she's a nice young prospect. Uh, now, let me ask you this, because I forgot to ask you. Do you think that Chaz Skelly deserved his win bonus because Embers couldn't make the walk? Uh, uh, see, and this is why. I, like the I, Dana Duffel. This is the Dana Duffel. This is where you come in and you give it to Duffel. him underhand. Yeah, or like, like I think Rogan and Schaub and other people have said that like the whole win bonus thing needs to go away anyway. Like you should just get paid to like, like, like an NFL player doesn't get more or less if they win or lose the game. Correct. NBA. Yeah. So, so I because think it's about the people, effort, you know, and showing up. And, and like I said, yeah. we kind of should, that's kind of my true answer. I know it's kind of a convoluted answer. It's like win <laughs> bonus. Like, that you're like, that shouldn't is, even be a thing. Yeah, not so much, but it's like, do I think the man deserves to make his money? Yes. So it's like, I'm kind of straddling the fence there. Because, like, it's like, if I'm Dana, I could easily, 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 here's why you don't get a win bonus, because it's called a win bonus and he didn't win anything. Or, but it's but like it, he, but it's like he made it to the octagon and was, it's like he was on the field and the team didn't come out of the locker room. Like in the NBA, that's a almost loss. like a forfeit. Yeah, no, I, I feel you, bro. I feel you. I feel you. I, I the, the, the answer to the question: Do I want that man to get as much money as possible? Yes. The, the, I like. The, I you see know, how you're phrasing it. Yeah, I'm just. I'm. I don't know. I'm playing a little verbal gymnastics here. Law your ball in it. Law yeah, your ball, ball in it. Yeah, yeah. You know how I like to get down, but uh, but man, we'll keep it pushing because this <laughs> next fight, everybody expected fireworks and it delivered. Unlike Absolutely. another fight on this card that everybody expected fireworks <laughs> for, and I thought it was a little lackluster. But we'll get to that. Uh, but yeah, this was um one of this was one of Dana White's. If you don't know now, you know. Um, and if you don't know about that now, you know because every every week the day before the fights, uh, Dana White's Instagram, he goes on there and he kind of breaks. Goes through the car, gives you a couple of fights he thinks are going to be fun, and they, it's cool. I, I love that. He's, I, I he that. knows his, his shit when he's really talking about that too. He to really be fair, does. like like Dana knows fight, fight styles. Like he understands matchups, and I appreciate that from the guy that is at the head of the organization. Yeah, man. Like I said, there's a million reasons not to like Dana, but when it comes to the like actual fight related shit, I love Dana, and. uh and, and, and so, yeah, I, I, so like I said, if you don't know, now you know about Dana's little, if you don't know, now you know, um, it's cool. He does it on Instagram, um, and he just gives you some fights to look out for. And this was one of them. 
this was a this this was a fight that him and he he wasn't the only one. Pretty much every MMA talking head said this was going to be a banger. Um, but we got Nate Landwehr minus one twenty five. Um, he's known for just you know being being a, a savage and, and walking forward and being down to throw hands and trade. Yep, um, dropping the hands and going forward. And then Erosa, you know, he's he's known for you know he he's um just like an explosive athlete, and he's you know known known to be super game too. And so we got we got him fighting at featherweight, one forty five, and um, man, controversial. We've already been talking about late stoppages. Some people may have said this was a tad early, including the man who was done on. I I don't know. Let's let's get into it a little bit. But yeah, round one, both men are trading, both men are landing. And then um, Erosa comes out with a flying knee. And, and, and catches him. Like, caught it clean, clean on the bottom clean, of the chin. Clean. And, and Lenver's arms, like, went fully out. Fully out. Like, when he hit the cage, his arms weren't with him. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it was yeah. almost like he was flash KO'd. So, I get it for Mark Smith to stop it. I really yeah. do. Because from the angle that he's standing, and that was what was important to me in, like, the, the replay was, like, the angle he's standing – he sees Landmere's face, like, over to the side and his arms, you know, loose. Yeah, so. well, and, and, and my takeaway from it, too, is I like to watch how a guy falls because there's a difference between dead weight falling, like, yes. dead body, and, and, and then, like, slipping or even a controlled fall, like, or, or you, you reach your arm down to brace yourself or, like, there's different levels of, like, dropping somebody. Like being and, aware that you're falling, essentially. That's, That's a great like, way to word it. That's a yeah. great way to word it. And Landler was not aware that he was no. falling. He um no exactly what you described a flash knockout. Like I think on the way down to the mat he was asleep, and then when he hit the mat it actually woke him back. Right. Up. That's exactly think, what I'm saying. And, That's exactly and so, what I think happened. And, and, and Landler's mind he because he was protesting quite hard. And I think this hard. was the fight Mark Smith. I think was the ref on. And yep. uh, you know we we both love Mark Smith and respect Mark Smith, but uh. And so he was protesting, like, a little, maybe even a little too much. He was very adamant that, you know, he wasn't knocked out. I thought it was excessive. I I see how he felt that way, because whenever he hit the (laughs) knock, he was awake. But there was a period in time from that knee touching his chin to him touching that mat where he was out cold, dead body weight, limp, just out. So I have zero problem with it. I do not think it was an early stoppage. Um, But it was an amazing fight. Um. Now this now I was a little surprised he didn't get a bonus. No bonus. That, so for yeah, that's that, and I and like I was saying, I had guessed that he would have been the guy to get one. But yeah, I mean, you you were an underdog. You get a flying knee first round. I mean, how many fifty six seconds? Did yeah, right. This yeah. but this was a night where they needed like six bonuses, or they could have done this one a fight of the night maybe because like that's the thing before before Erosa dropped Landwehr. Landwehr dropped Erosa with, I'm pretty right. sure, the right hand. So yeah, like, it was like, a right hand that caught him on, like, like, the back of the head. I think the like... fight lasted two minutes, and there were, like, three knockdowns total, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So, I mean, it was an amazing fight. I mean, usually fight of the nights go to, like, you know, three or five-round wars. But, I mean, it was, it was, this was a great fight. Yeah, said, 50, I, if 56 I, if, seconds was the official time. Oh, it was only 56? I, I, I was being yeah. generous. I said two minutes. I was like, oh, surely, you know. Because it seemed fast, but I was like, surely guys <laughs> three, didn't get dropped three times in a minute, but they did. It was 56 maybe, seconds. It was almost like a street fight. Yeah, like bang. it really was. Like, they were just banging. They were just trading huge shots. It was awesome. It was awesome. It, it, was, it was really awesome to watch. And it's one of those things where, you know, Landwehr doesn't really, I don't feel like, you know, hurt himself too much in this loss because – he people expect a war from him, and that's what he brought. And like he could have very easily clipped Erosa, and, and it would be a different story. It was like somebody was going to drop in the way they were fighting at that pace, and uh, yeah, it happened to be him. Um, now Erosa, you know, I think that's a very very nice win on him because people were high on Erosa even before this, and then to get a flying knee, super athletic, like just highlight knockout against a tough son of a bitch like Landwehr. I mean, that's a feather in your cap. I mean, that doesn't, oh, yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't hurt your case. You know what I mean? That looks nice on the old resume. And he cut a pretty sick promo at the end when he was talking to Bisping, whenever Bisping asked him, like, uh, do you think that that was an early stoppage? And he was like, no, nah, man, Mark Smith saved that guy's life. He was like, it's yeah. killed, killed him there, and I was about to kill him. And I was like, he gave, he gave me, he gave me Sanhagen vibes. I just yeah. like Sanhagen, like, after, like, his – Went over Edgar like like I wasn't here like this isn't a game like this was a fight yeah. Like, like, like yeah no it gave me gave me Sanhagen vibes which 
is exciting because we talk all the time about how much of the game is mental and mindset and, you know, going in these fighters' confidence levels. And he seems to be in killer mode. So, yeah, like I said, featherweight, another absolutely jam-packed uh, division. Uh, but, I mean, we got, we got another young killer coming up, Eros. I mean, there's a, there's a million young killers in that division. But, I mean, add, add his name to the list. Yeah, Julian Juicy J. Rosa. <laughs> yeah, Juicy J. Rosa, man. But uh, um, fun but fight. Yeah. We'll keep it pushing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the next fight, men's bantamweight, uh, 135. We have Eddie Wineland, the old school vet, <clears throat> plus 105 versus uh, John Castaneda at minus 125. And honestly, yeah, Castaneda is another DWCS guy, right? If I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, that sounds like, yeah. that sounds right. And Eddie me. Wineland's a huge name. It's coming off, obviously, that loss to O'Malley, that scary KO loss. And he's Man, just that... lots of fight miles, getting old. It, it gets scary for 135. The small guys, when they get old, it gets a little scary for him. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, like, I mean, he, he's still, you know, he's still dangerous. That's the thing. He's still right. dangerous. Like, he's not an easy night out, but he does – Seem to be getting finished at, at a more ordinary rate, you know what I mean? Um, and I gotta just t- take a second because he has the big mustache, he has nothing but like the old school American traditional tattoos, and he, he does literally this. looks like the Notre Dame fighting Irish guy. And it, it's like it's it's almost like it's like, is this a troll? Is this a, is this a <laughs> stick? Like, is this a bit? Like, is he running material right now? <laughs> like, but he's been doing it for years. And what's even funnier is his feints, like, you know, some guys, like, move their shoulders like that, like, stuff like that. Uh, he literally will get his hands and, like, roll them. Like, roll. Yeah. Like, and no, it's it like. It literally looks like, hey, put him up, put him up. Yeah. Like, like, like he like looks like the Notre Dame fighting Irish guy. If you put him in a green suit, we can put him on the football <laughs> field on Saturday. Yeah, man. And it's, it, it, I got to say. <laughs> Mixed martial arts is moving away from, like, kind of gimmicky styles like that. Like, that used to be more prevalent back in the day of, like... I mean, he was a WEC champion. Yeah, man. And, but it, it's, like, part of me appreciates it. Because I know, like, maybe 10, 15 years from now, you're not going to see an Eddie Wyland out there. And it's kind of a, a relic from the past. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, uh, but but anyway, um, we'll, we'll give it a push. That's one of the, but an uh, entertaining fight. I, I got to say... I'm not a fan of the John Sexy Mexi Castaneda nickname. Weak nickname. Yeah, me, I, uh, yeah, agreed. So, I mean, we've talked about everything but the fight. Break, it was a, the fight didn't last long. First round TKO um, at the end of the round, though. So, break, break down the first round for us. Yeah, so, honestly, Eddie Wineland was the more active guy at the start, was, like, leading the action, was throwing some nice right hands. They were super fast to start. Yeah. And then Castaneda in his post-fight interview even noted that, like, he did get hit with a couple hands that were faster than he thought they were going to be. And he was like, yeah, so I got a little gun shy. I was starting to play a little defensively. But then he found that opening uh, and essentially kind of started to take over. I felt like about a minute before he finished Wineland, he started to actually be the aggressor, which was a big part of of what opened up his game because – Wyland on his back foot is a lot different than Wyland coming forward. Yes. Yeah. So definitely got him on his back foot, caught him with that. I believe it was a hard left. And then from there just had him rocked and landed like a seven piece combo. It like, was it was like a video game like Tekken combo, just like right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Right. right like left, it's left, like yeah. that, that that seven piece can be like thirteen fifty at churches. I guess that's a lot of pieces, you know what I mean? And yeah, man. drops Eddie Wineland. Gets on him, you know, hits him a couple more times, <clears throat> keeps hit, keeps hitting him. Eddie Wineland starts to try to get back up, and but the, at that point, uh, Herzog stepped in, called the fight. Eddie Wineland kind of protested it once again. These guys got to stop protesting. Yeah, when, when and, they're done, like you're well, finished. And, and I guess I got to like, I don't know, maybe pass isn't the right word. Like Wineland's been fighting since a time where that may not have been a stoppage. Yeah, but with his last KO loss and, like, how brutal it was, like, if he gets subjected to a second one, we're talking possible brain damage. And no, like, no, I, I feel you, bro. Like, I'm not saying I wanted to see it, but I'm just saying, like, oh, I know. Wineland's logic, like, he's been fighting so long in the in the kind of goalpost of what a stoppage is has shifted in that time to where I, 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 I give him more of a pass than, than, the la- than, uh, than I give to um, – than I give to Landwehr. Yeah, I and yeah, I agree. I agree. Like Landwehr was like out, and then was like protesting it so vehemently that it was like, all right, bro. Like 
it's pretty much cartoonish at this point. Like you, you lost. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, for Wineland, I think he saw the replay after uh, and and was like, oh yeah, okay. Like yeah, he's when, he's at least enough Wineland, of a veteran to accept it. Yeah, and the ref was definitely saving him from himself. Like like right. nobody's saying you're not tough. Nobody's even saying you were out cold. But it was yeah. yeah we're not yeah. We're not saying it was stop. a knockout. Like it was definitely. Yeah. A t- and like I do make a point in all my breakdowns when I write the the result. If it's a KO, like if they're out, I write KO. And if it's a, like a referee stopping it, I write TKO. Like I do yep. differentiate that because I think it's important. Like if you get put out cold, that has lingering effects. Dude, so, so what, did, what did you consider the Arosa Landwehr one? Was that a TKO? That was a KO. KO. That was a KO yeah. for me. Yeah. Because he yeah. was out. Yeah, he was out. All right, cool, cool, for sure. And we get another one. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that uh, that wasn't the only true KO of the night. Uh, but, yeah, tons of finishes last night, which you, yeah, you're crazy. not going to catch any MMA fan anywhere complaining about that, man. Um, but, yeah, tons of finishes. And then we, let's get to this feature prelim, bro. Uh, we got our uh, Jared Gordon. Pretty much even money underdog plus one hundred fighting Danny Chavez minus one twenty so essentially a pick him uh, fighting yeah. at featherweight and um, so Gordon actually weighed in at one hundred and fifty pounds so he was five pounds almost almost like earlier he, he was damn near weighing in at lightweight so you know that's that's never cool but uh, and didn't you know, seem to affect his performance too much. You want to know what's crazy though about him being a plus one hundred is when this fight was announced and opened on betting he was minus one eighty. That's right. So he got bet down. Like, so much money came in on Danny Chavez, which means Vegas raked people over the coals last night. Yeah, yeah. A bunch of money was coming in on Chavez. And it almost seemed like the broadcast was kind of leaning Chavez, too. But it went, when a guy misses weight, it's hard to, like – Hard to cheer for that, him. And Danny Chavez is a young prospect at 145 again. We had a ton yeah. of featherweight and heavyweight fights tonight. Or last featherweight night. Featherweight and bantamweight. Featherweight, bantamweight, and, and heavyweight, I think, was, like, essentially the whole card for sure. No, I guess it was a middleweight. Nice, nice variety now that I think back on it. But, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, you know, so when a guy misses weight, it, it, it's essentially one of two things. Either he – he the weight cut – either way the weight cut went bad, obviously, because it was unsuccessful. Right. But either, either he, like, literally bottomed out at 150 and he just sucked his whole body dry and still – and still – and that's usually when you see a bad performance. Or whatever, it didn't go right the other way. Maybe he wasn't disappointed enough or whatever, but at least he's not, like, super dehydrated. And, like, I don't know. Like, For me, like, this looked like he knew he wasn't going to make it, so he stopped the stopped. cut before it got way too brutal. And decided, that's what I should have said. And decided, I'll just forfeit 20% and get the yeah. win bonus. Yes, that's the – that is exactly – it was a way better wording version of what I was trying to say. So, yeah, uh, and the, very, I mean that's that's the nice chess, that's the chess play of it, right? Is like, do you think that that extra four pounds is going to deplete you so much that you can't even perform? Because it is really not worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly, there's two different kinds of uh, missed weight cuts, and I feel like we saw both of those um, on, on yeah, display absolutely last night. Um, but man, so round one was really close. Um, both men were landing. Um, this was probably up until this point of the card the hardest to judge round yet because up until this point it was all pretty obvious pretty clear cut um man this was a really close round i gave it 10-9 gordon i thought he landed a little me too a little cleaner okay okay me too i'm okay good because i was this is the hardest round i think to score of the night for me yeah yeah there was uh, uh, there was a close round that phil haas we'll get to it but that's a hard one to score too um But, yeah, man, so I went to Gordon, although I did write, like, I'm not mad if you gave it to Chavez. Like, I can exactly. definitely see the case for him. Yeah, 100%. Like, I, I gave it I gave it 10-9 Gordon, but like I said, it was purely, like, subjective. Like, I didn't have anything, like, I could really point to him, like, this is why. I just kind of felt he landed a little harder. I thought he maybe, you know, impacted. Just eye test almost. Eye test, yeah, 100%. 100%. 100%. And then um, round two was definitely not – close and it definitely wasn't as close and then this is where we started to get the Bisping hot takes a little bit if you want uh so uh so round two gordon was winning pretty dominantly it was a nice round um lots and lots of ground and pound for gordon and um i was kind of on the fence because i was getting ready in my notes to write like 10 8 question mark like was it a 10 8 like what do you think it was a pretty dominant round but it wasn't like hell yeah balls deep this is a 10 8 all day i was the edge, kind of the edge of a 10 8 yeah, yeah, and then um, – but then Bisping comes in and was like, oh, without a doubt, that was a 10-8 round, which 
Not we, we found out. We found out later in the night, though. He was loose with a ten eight. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that man yeah, would get so. ten sevens. So, and it's kind of rare and weird in general that you don't typically hear the commentator like full blown like live judge a fight. Like every, you know, like you don't you don't hear that too often. Which, well, it's not I, what they want. I, I know it's not what they want. Now, me personally, I don't hate it. I, no, I, I like it. I wouldn't like, mind yeah. if DC scored fights. I would be. I, I, I mean, we've talked about how retired fighters should be the guys scoring fights. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Um, so, so yeah, so we we um, so I guess I'll leave it up to you. Final, final verdict. You, did you have it round two a ten eight? I did, I did, I did give it a ten eight. So yeah. I had Gordon up twenty to seventeen going into the third. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. And then I also gave the third to Gordon, 10-9. He had as the takedown. He had the grapple. Not as much damage. I think in his he, – he was fighting round three like he knew he had rounds one and two in the bag. Like, you know what I'm yes. saying? A little, a little yes. more cautious, which that Smarter. didn't buy fighters in the ass, but this was not one of those times. It ended up working out just fine for him. He did enough to still win the round and ultimately win the fight. He got the unanimous decision. Um, I didn't write down the individual scorecard. Did the judges give him a 10 8 on that round two, too? Or? So, no, no one did. They So, two guys went 30 27, and one judge went 29 28. Wow. Which, wow, I mean, yeah. 29 28, you gave Chavez the first round, you gave Gordon the right. second and third. So, all you're good. Right. I get it. Yeah, all good. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. But Gordon technically, you know, cashes as an underdog, even if it was a very small underdog. But, yeah. Um, Good light money came in on Chavez, and they, you know, Vegas was happy about that. Um, <laughs> you know, they cleaned up on that, but yeah, Gordon. I mean, I, I gotta say, like, Gordon looked good, but to be in the in the featured prelim spot, like, I thought Erosa looked better. Like, mm-hmm. if I had to pick, like, a featherweight, I'm taking from the prelims, like, moving forward with, you know, uh, adding a little cult to the hype train too. I think I think I'm uh, leaning Erosa over Gordon, a Julian Erosa guy. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm with that. Um, he now Gordon great. looked a little more complete. Like he showed the grappling, and and you know, I, I think actually Gordon e. Rosa would be a really fun matchup if they and they both fought. You know, the yeah, there's a lot of matchups on this card. I feel like that they were trying to like pit winners against each other for future fights, it, and it's, we it's, saw that happen with the heavyweights here coming up. It's a good formula, man. It's a good formula. It makes sense to the fans. It doesn't give a, leave a lot of room for like pushback or excuse making from the fighters. Like it, it I, I, I'm not mad at it. I think it makes a lot, a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, man, that wraps up the prelims. Um, and I'm definitely great prelims. Keep it, yeah, great prelims and a great main card. Like I said, for three last night, we got a lot of bang for our buck. Um, and with all the quality, I'm not so mad at the dip in quantity. You know what I'm saying? Like, if those extra four fights would have all been decisions, it's like, I'm cool with not having them. We got a bunch of badass banging finishes instead. Absolutely. I'm absolutely with that. Yeah, but, I mean, we can keep pushing the main card if you want. Yeah, I'm down, man. Uh, might need to Sweet. grab some more weed here in a second, but I think we'll, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll survive. <laughs> nice. Well, the first fight of the night, man, was probably the one that I was, like, the most, like, bet the house on this guy. Like, it, he's going to, like – Put him, put him to work. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I felt, I felt pretty good. I felt pretty good about um, Aspinall in this one as well. Yeah. So heavyweight fight, Mark Smith's the ref. We have uh, the veteran Andre Arlovsky plus two ten uh, versus Tom Aspinall, uh, the young up and comer, twenty seven minus two sixty. Uh, yeah. Dude, for, um, for for people that don't realize that Aspinall's a Brazilian Jiu black belt. His dad is an instructor over in England. So like he came up doing it. And then beyond that, he's been, he was a professional boxer before MMA and his sparring partner was Tyson Fury. Credentialed. So, well, yeah. well, well credentialed. Um, yeah, not, not, which in heavyweights can sometimes can be rare because in heavyweight, you get a lot of big guys that hit hard and former football players and, you know, things of that nature. But to have lifelong martial artists, you usually see that and some of the smaller weight classes, but for heavyweight, right. I mean, that, that's why he's so promising for sure. Um, but yeah, Olavsky, yeah, you said plus 210, minus 260 for Aspinall. Cool little story. Um, Aspinall actually watched Andre Olavsky fight when he was a kid. I think he said he was like 14 years old. Yeah. Went to a UFC fight with his dad and watched Olavsky fight. And then now he's fighting with him. So just proves how long Olavsky's been at it. 
cool little story. You know, you you hear stuff like that happen. Like Tom Brady was a little kid whenever um, and I, I, when Joe Montana won one of those Super Bowls, the one at Stanford, right. I believe. Right. So, uh, so yeah, just you hear little stories like that of I know the whole idols become your rival storyline. It's just cool, man. It's just cool. I mean, it's uh, it's just undeniably cool. And you know, it's like one of these days we do a podcast with one of the people we look up to. You know. Uh, Thankfully, we don't have to punch each other in the face. That's a little different, but uh, but yeah, man, we can we can get we can get to the actual fight, man. Um, round one, Aspinall looked good. Um, I had a ten nine Aspinall. Um, I could possibly see a ten eight though because Aspinall got within a nut hair finishing um Arlovsky with that. Yeah, it was close. Round. Like like he was peppering him up. He was lighting him up. He was tagging him up, touching him up. Whatever verbiage you want to put on it, um, he was he was giving him the hands in at the end of round one. So I gave it ten nine, but I mean, I he got so close to finishing him. I mean, I wouldn't even be mad at a ten eight. But. I also gave it ten nine, but like you're saying, like it is that edge where I lean just the other way on this one. So, uh, you know, ten nine for it. Uh, what's crazy though is a bit, and Bisping noted it. That's the longest that Aspinall's been in the octagon was last night. Uh, all of his other fights ended within a hundred seconds. So yeah, and he and he had Arlovsky rocked at that about hundred second mark, which was funny to note. But um, yeah, in the second round, man, Arlovsky caught him with like a, a pretty good shot, I thought. But and that if that's Arlovsky's best shot, and Aspinall just eats it like that, that's a bad sign for Arlovsky right there. I thought that was the telltale sign of like, oh, this is going to end badly. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And but, but what? I don't think anybody's shocked at what happened, but how it happened, I think, caught everybody watching. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so Al- Aspinall ends up winning by um, by submission. He he gets he slides in the rear naked choke, and um, I don't know. Maybe it was a little bit of Khabib-esque mercy. Like, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right. Because like, uh, he really <laughs> does look up to Orlovsky and is a fan of him, and he was, he was beating the shit out of him. Um, also, I mean, the opportunity presented itself. Like I said, nobody in the building, obviously including Arlovsky, expected him to try to take the back and get the rear naked choke. So it's like he didn't even really defend it. Like there was zero resistance. Like as soon as Aspinall went for the RNC, he got the RNC. And it was a pretty fast time. It just it caught everybody off guard. It caught the commentators off guard. It caught me off guard. Clearly caught Arlovsky off guard. And, uh, you, you could tell Arlovsky like literally just like knew it was locked in and was just like, fuck. And like did like the... Sorry for anyone that if I'm slapping my mic. Uh, but, yeah, just, like, did, like, the one tap and then was, like, I essentially turned to Aspen and was, like, good catch. Like, he caught yeah, me. Yeah, he got catch. me. He got – yeah, exactly. He wasn't mad. It was good sportsmanship. It was good vibes. Um, like I said, I'm I'm kind of glad we didn't have to watch, you know, our lobs could get pounded to oblivion. I knew yeah, that. me too, man. Re- rear naked choke is a good way to finish. So like I said, maybe maybe a little bit of that Khabib gauging mercy a little bit deciding to go for the finish. But regardless, you know, it's a nice – I think uh, Aspinall by sub was plus 1,000. I think plus, I saw plus, so- plus 1,200. Oh, plus 1,200. Yeah. So yeah. Vegas is adding to the list of people who didn't see it coming. That Add Vegas to that list, too. So, you know, it's surprising. You said Aspinall's known for his hands. But, as you noted, has been rolling on the mat since he was a small child. So, you know, yeah. he definitely you know, qualified to do that rear naked choke. Uh, yeah, it was nice. It was, it was cool. It was, it was a, a stellar performance by Aspinall. Um, he gets the 50 Gs. That's, a, that's one of the 50 guys who got 50 Gs. Um, he gets the performance of the night bonus. Um, Deservedly so. And I mean, you got to imagine he's he's heading towards them rankings. Um, you know, he just he keeps. Well, he he, keeps, he called he called for a fight of the winner of the Chris Dawkins and uh, Alexi Olenek fight. So, uh, and I think I, that was a great call, that out. call out. It was a great call out. And it leads to exactly what we were just saying a minute ago about the the matchmaking and putting people on the same card who could fight next, like kind of quasi little Grand Prix. Uh, I, I right. say, we're, we're, we're both fans of it. Apparently the fighters are fans of it too because I've been hearing more and more fighters in their call out to be like, oh, he's fighting on the same night, so no excuses. Like, we right, both like it makes sense. Tonight. It, just, it, it, it works on a lot of different fronts. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, it, it'd be one thing if, if only the fans liked it and only McMahon liked it. But like I said, it, it, for all, all indications are that the fighters are digging it too. So, yeah, let's, let's keep it rolling with that. I'm, I'm definitely a fan of having guys on the same weight class fight on the same card, potential right. future matchups. It, it makes it fun, it, fun to talk about for us. And like I said, it makes it, makes it easy for everybody involved. Now, this next fight. So this is the next fight I kind of feel a certain type of way about. 
I had this fight circled. Like, if I was going to make it, if you don't know, now you know, like Dana was, like, I would have pointed at this fight. Like, uh, and I actually, I think this was on Dana's too, but, like, even before watching Dana's, like, I was I was hyped on this fight, uh, Haas versus Amavov, and I was like, I don't know, I just, I was hyped on this fight. I thought it was going to be fireworks, and it, it ended up being a good fight. But it just – it kind of did a scratch that itch for me. I don't know. Maybe it's my fault for hyping it up too much, but it's just a little anticlimactic for me. I think it was one of those ones where, like, it was uh, just a stylistic nightmare as far as, yeah. like, whenever these guys fight other people, they both, uh, like, are stellar highlight machines. But then when they meet each other, it's kind of like the the immovable force meets the unstoppable object. You know what I mean? Like No, 100%. It, uh, or I said it backwards. Im- immovable object means no stop before. But I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Y- yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the middleweight's 185. Uh, Tanyoni's the ref. Only important to note because he was just <laughs> was way too involved. Uh, Phil Haas fighting uh, Nasrudin Imavov or Imavov, however you want to say it. Uh, Phil Haas was the favorite at minus 125, and uh, Nasrudin was the underdog at plus 105. Uh, so yeah. pretty, pretty close to even. Pretty close, yeah, pretty much. A, that's why I was so stoked that both of these guys have a ton of finishes. Both of these guys are super scary. And my mom's like six foot three, I believe, which I middleweight yeah. is this gargantuan. Um, and, and I think Haas has five consecutive first round knockouts going into this fight. So th- th- that's why I was just like, oh, this is the fucking fight. Like, yeah, and, and, and it, it was just fine. There was nothing wrong with this fight. Like I said, I think I, I, I was just the expectations were like were a little too lofty to meet to, to clear that bar but uh fine fight nothing wrong with this fight like i said i was just expecting just i don't, I don't know what i was expecting but like i said a lot of us were excited for this fight leading so, up to it so how'd you score the first round yeah yeah in round one i had a 10-9 haas um he was landing very hard because that's what haas does um but he also had the takedown and i thought it looked just fine in the grappling exchanges too so yeah i, I had a 10-9 haas in one I, he was laying some nice leg kicks early on too which i thought were I, I, I put a little, a little more scoring. I'm starting to put more scoring into leg kicks is what I, what I mean to say. Just from yeah. what we've been seeing recently with how effective they've been. So I agree with you. I thought Haas won the first round 10-9. Uh, the second round, though, got super interesting. Yes, yes. It got super, super interesting because, man, um, up until a certain point, it was almost looking like a repeat of round one. I mean, there was, some t- there was a takedown for Haas. Some good grappling going on. But then they got back to the feet, and Amavov, towards the end of round two, had Haas wobbled. I mean, he was hitting him with some shots. Like, Haas was wobbled, I think, at least three times in this yeah, fight. Like, like three separate times. Three knees looking like a fucking earthquake's going on. Just like, whoa. Like, Crazy, that like, Crazy that he never went down. Crazy that he never went down. I don't know. It's just – it's weird. Like I don't. It, that makes it so hard to score because it's like he, like, did he wear it well? Like on one hand, <laughs> like he was getting cut up or the hematomas, or but his knees were like betraying him. Like his face, he had a poker face of, of a fucking champion, but his knees were betraying him. Like his knees, like I said, looked like a fucking suspension bridge in an earthquake. He's on chicken legs. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah, man. He was getting so so. As, as far as scoring round two, I, I officially gave it 10-9 Haas. And I said the majority of the round, you know, Haas was in control. But as far as damage goes, like, I am not mad at anybody that gives round two to Imava. Like, in the moment, I leaned Haas. But honestly, looking back on it, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence. And I'm not mad if you give round two to Imava. Yeah, I'm, so I'm with you. I scored it 2018 to Haas as well, uh, just for, like, his ability to get the takedown whenever he was yeah. in trouble, stay in control. Uh, I thought it was enough to take the round, but like you're saying, like if you're scoring it just based on pure damage, you might give it to him, Abba. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I wouldn't, wouldn't die on that hill at all, at all. And then, um, then the third else, though gets interesting. Yeah, it gets very, very, very interesting. interesting, especially considering how I just um, described round two. Because so in round three, I actually give a ten nine to Mava. Um, he wobbled Hayes multiple times. So like what he did at the end of the second. He did two more times in the third, and it was just too much for me to ignore and look past. And like I said, I kind of, I kind of felt guilty for looking past it too. And I was like, well, I definitely can't. Look. He did it two more times. I definitely got to give him off off three. So, like I said, on my own scorecard, I'm kind of like, 
I don't want to say disagreeing with myself, but man, if I was to watch this fight again, I may end up scoring at 29, 28 Amavov. Round two is super hard to score. So <laughs> I, I, I gave round three to Amavov, though. How about you? Yeah, I, I so much so that I actually scored it at 10-8 for Amavov. Mm. I thought he had Haas in a lot of trouble and that Haas was just surviving the round. Oh, I so, agree. I agree. I'm, I'm not and, mad at that. I'm not mad at that was, at all. And maybe it was the influence of Bisping just getting that 10-9 magic running in me. But, <laughs> yeah, I gave him off of that 10-8 or that third round of 10-8, and that actually gave me a 28-28 scorecard. So you agree with this. So and, and one of the judges actually scored a 28-28 draw. The other two judges scored it 29-27, uh, right? 29-28. 29-28 uh, uh, for, for Haas. So it's funny. Our scorecards actually line up with the judges' scorecards of the majority decision. Um, yeah. But like I said, I, I, it's, it's a weird thing where I damn near agree with your scorecard more than I agree with my <laughs> scorecard, or, 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 or did a or you can see it. Yeah. I, like this one was dicey. Um, Haas won the majority decision. If it was, if it would have been a unanimous decision, you know, that would have been. I, got, I can't believe these words are going to come out of my mouth. I think the judges got this one right. Just as far as the fact that it was a majority decision, like it yeah. wasn't unanimous, you know, it was a very hard to score, very close. Uh, no, I mean, but I mean, it, it, right? If you're sitting in a mob ops camp, you're like, I almost finished that motherfucker three times, and I was never <laughs> close to being in danger once. Right. You gotta not feel awesome as a mob ops, and he uh, he didn't look happy at the end of the fight. No, I mean, I get it. That one, that one was difficult. So. I don't know. I, I, I came into this saying how this fight didn't live up to the hype, and then I'm saying how close and awesome of a fight it was. So I don't know. Like I said, I, it, I, if somebody would have gone to sleep, like, like you know. Uh, yeah, it would have been so definitive. Been, uh, yeah. 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 And like I said, and then you get the murky decision, and maybe that kind of just leaves a bad taste in your mouth, and it's like, damn, yeah, can, can we make this one a five-rounder? Or what? Yeah, the, the, yeah, like, are we going to run this back for five? Or, like, how are we yeah. going to do this, Dana? Like, let's get it settled. No, I feel you. I feel you. Maybe maybe their paths will cross, you know, further down the line. That's always kind of fun. That, kind of fun. best result for the UFC though, because like they're both young prospects, so this doesn't hurt Imavov at all, really, and just kind of gives Haas a win to keep building with. So, and it's kind, kind of a of stock like, rise for both guys. And it's kind of like one of those like Holloway Volkanovski losses where you can be like, oh yeah, that's like, a loss on my record, but I mean, you go back like, and watch the fight and. Exactly. Like I don't know. Not not that moral victories are a thing, but in fighting, like there's all there's those there's those certain losses that like MMA fans agree upon. Like oh yeah, like that loss was questionable. We're not gonna hold that against you too much. Like and all of them eyes. Yeah, there's plenty of those fights. Yeah, yeah, and and this just kind of falls in that category for sure. So yeah, both these guys, bright futures, bright bright futures, and like I said, the fight was a lot of fun. Haas, Mala, both like I said, both still rising middleweights. Like you said, it's, you can't really say one like on a skid now or anything. If anything, in the long run, I can see a scenario where a mom Bob, this actually helps his career because they don't toss him a killer next. He kind of gets another win, gets back on track, and then maybe Haas goes on to get tossed a monster next. And so you never know how this shakes out in the long term. Um, right. Yeah, Haas, Haas on, last night, you know, got the better of him, and, and we'll keep it pushing because at the end of the day, that he gets the W you know, in his record. Majority decision, rare decision, but yeah, good for both guys. I think they both have like bright futures moving forward. Uh, now, speaking of bright future and this next fight, heavyweight, we have uh, Chris Dawkins, the Philadelphia police officer, at minus two hundred. Yes. Uh, versus the, I mean, this guy, seventy fifth professional mixed martial arts fight, Alexi Olenek, uh, number ten ranked heavyweight at plus one seventy. It, it, like and Olenek just looks like it, man. Like he looks, he looks like the old, old guy at the gym who, like, you know, puts his knee up on the bench and just has his balls hanging to his knee. You know what I'm saying? Like he just he literally looks like an elder gentleman in in the octagon. Like, but I know he's credentialed. I know he's a legend. A legend, but I just I don't know. Time time to hang it up. I don't know. In my opinion, like, uh, um, that's why I'm just shaking my head over here because it's like, man. I'm tired of watching you fight Alexi. Like, it's at the point where it's just like, enough's enough. You know what I mean? Like, why are you still doing it? Yeah, they now, at this point, it's like a like... sad reason. Yeah, they toss some guys that are just going to KO the shit out of him. <laughs> it's so brutal, dude. So Every brutal. Time. Like, like they're just trying to hurt his brain. I don't get it at this point. 
Well, they're trying to send and pack it, man. They just made no, you know, qualms about that. Like, you know, he, he's trying to get these old fucks moving on, on to something else. And, uh, yeah, because Alexi Linnick came into this fight holding the number 10 ranking, which is also, like, like I get it. Like That's a, a paper rank. rank. Like, that's, yeah, that's a paper, a paper rank. rank. Exactly, exactly. Like, and then Doc has proved it essentially right here. And like I said, maybe – Maybe this kind of this problem just kind of takes care of itself. But uh, we got Alexia Linick plus one sixty underdog. Honestly, like getting Dawkins at minus two hundred in this fight, that's a great number to get him at. I mean, obviously hindsight's twenty. I saw but... a lot of guys calling for a Dawkins first round KO. A lot of guys calling for that on the internet. So and that was that had, with minus two hundred, he pr- that had to have been a first round KO to call it like that. Probably a. A plus three hundred, plus four hundred. Yeah, it, yeah, uh, it gets you, it gets you on the right side of things for sure. And uh, yeah, and just like I said, I know, I know, we're not necessarily betting experts, but little things like that can make a big difference, which I learned firsthand last night. And we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah, yes, like, sir. When, whenever you're picking, whenever you're gonna bet on a fight, anybody watching, you're gonna bet on a fight, right? And it's, I'm talking not bet your buddy twenty bucks, like or some beers. Like I'm talking on a real bet, Vegas style, you know, whether it be online or in person or whatever. Um, Whatever, you got to ask yourself two questions. Who's going to win the fights? The clearly obvious answer. But then also, how are they going to win that? Yeah, fight? path um, to victory. Path to victory. And then you can usually find way better odds that align with what you think is going to happen. Because, like, if, if – like, if, I mean, like I said, I, I did it last night. If you, if you think a guy's going to – potentially he could win the fight, but the only way he's going to win the fight is by knockout, then bet the fight by knockout and get a way better number. You know what I mean? So that's um, it's just a little basic betting advice 101 for some amateurs. You know, you're trying to people – a lot more people are dipping the toe in the water nowadays. You know, it's more accepted. It's more accessible. And, right, know, nationally little, legalized. But yeah. and then there's also things uh, that are like – I would say like the – the what is it? The, the parlays are hidden in the crumbs essentially, right? So yeah. like what, what I'm saying with that is though is that like when we talk about – uh, Aspinall being a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, his dad being an instructor, so like he grew up doing jiu-jitsu all the time. And then also you think about he likes Arlovsky. He's watched him fight before. So like like you're saying with the Khabib thing, like he doesn't want to just ground and pound him out. Like when you start looking at these clues and putting them together, it would make sense that he might get a submission there. And then you can get it at plus 1,200 with just a little digging. That, that second and third later, them tertiary stats, them – background stories yeah that's what you just dive that tiny bit deeper and can, and can make yourself some more money um and the money's in the crumbs yeah yeah for sure man that's a, that's great advice great advice so yeah man um you know th- we're talking about all this other stuff because the actual fight you know is not too complex to break down um uh, another first round finish we got another tko um this was a unique scenario where alexia olenic never dropped it was a standing TKO. And Olenek tried to pull, like, pu- pull Dawkins to the ground, try to get, like, a, a leg lock heel hook going. Dawkins did a phenomenal job to stay standing where he, he was like, we're not going to go to the ground. Like, you're a decorated jiu-jitsu guy. We're not doing that. And I thought that was a masterful start, and it put Alexi in a bad spot. Then he started getting caught. And you're right. He got finished on the cage, but, like, I thought it was a warranted stoppage by Herb oh. Dean. Oh, a hundred percent of warranted stoppage. It's just like, yeah, like Alexi Olenek is just a a tank. Like he's that tank that barely runs, but if you shoot it, the bullet's still gonna bounce off. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the engine and the gears are uh, rusty, but the the outside armor is just fine. You know, and uh, and we've talked about the old aging heavyweight kind of. We we've talked about that before. I don't want to get right. into it too much right now but probably uh, time for him to hang it up though i think we both probably agree. time to hang it up and like as the local rankings mcgee you just can't have that guy's that <laughs> every way. like you just can't it's it's a bad look it's just uh it, it invalidates a lot of the other rankings you said it was a paper ranking now the upside to it is i mean for all intents and purposes you can essentially slide docus in at 10 and now that makes perfect sense i think when you think of the tenth best heavyweight in the world, a guy like Dawkins is exactly who should come to your mind. What do you think about Dawkins going to ten and Aspinall being probably around fourteen? Perfect. And then, and then, they, they, and fight then they fight. Yeah. And then and then whoever wins that fight's like a certified like inserts themselves into the conversation, especially like 
in the heavyweights right now, I was looking at it. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the top ten, two of the top ten spots are essentially not real because you got Olenek who just got bumped out, and then Overeem. I mean, I think we're all. I think. Well, I mean, it seems like he's going to retire. Maybe not, but I mean. I don't he know. has I'm, he has one fight left on his UFC contract, and, and we'll get to it. But I think I know who his last opponent's going to be. Yeah, we'll get to it. And it's like I say, it doesn't really seem like he's really going to be like a factor as far as being a contender. I feel like he's yeah, he'll be out of the rankings within four months. Th- that that's kind of what I'm saying. So it's like you kind of got to take his ranking with a grain of salt. So like, that's what I'm saying. Like if if Dawkins versus. Um, if Dawkins versus Aspinall is like 10 versus 14, that's really like 8 versus 12 if you think about it. Good and, point. And, and, and then the winner of that fight, I mean, is, is, is well in. They're, like the yeah, minute. they're, they're going to be right there with like the Gane or like yeah, the Stroik or those exactly. kinds of guys. Yeah, that, that B-tier heavyweight. You, you move up into like, yeah, 100%. 100%. So that's fun. That's so fun. And like you said, that's exactly who Aspinall wanted was the winner of the Dawkins and Linux fight. I think he knew exactly who that winner was going to be when he said that. And uh, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Let's make that happen, McMahon. It. And um, yeah, also interesting, um, Dawkins weighed in at 234. So he's kind of like on this like way, new wave of the Stipe's, the, yeah. the, the, the Shrimmer. Well, Aspinall weighed in at what, 245? Yep, 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 and then that's probably not cutting a single pound, most likely. So, yeah, so, yeah I mean, um, I don't know. I like I like both of these guys. I like I like the new blood in the heavyweight division. Um, now, I mean, time will tell. I mean, maybe if it, if the, if it lines up like this, but if if guys of this size, and, and not just guys of this size, but like these specific guys at this size. Can can hold up to a punch from a, a Derek Lewis or Rosen strike, you right? Because it is like, a different level. Yeah, it, 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 will that come into play at some point? Um, so I mean, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Chris Doc has looked amazing. Another 50, 50 G re- recipient performance of the night. Um, performance of the night winner, and yeah, man. Oh, I mean, he just. Barrage of punches to finish Olenek, and like I said, Olenek never really got knocked out or dropped. But I don't think a single person wanted to see that that man take a single more punch. Like he he wasn't intelligently right. defending. He he, right. he, he he his head was a speed bag essentially. And uh, yeah, I, I have no problem with it. And we can keep it pushing. Hell yeah! This next fight was awesome. Now for for like a casual, and I, I know we talk about how we love that term. For a casual, they probably would have hated this fight. But this fight was masterful. Yeah. Masterful. Honestly, by both guys. In, yeah. In a different sense for both guys. But, like, okay, so men's featherweight, 145. Mark Smith again. Mark Smith had some sick fights last night. Uh, I, I don't know. I just love Mark Smith. We'll get just, love Mark just the Smith, focus. And, well, and then the other people make it, like, guys like Tonyoni and Dean make it so, like, obvious that they're not, like, you know what I mean? You're not going to – so it just they're like, too involved in the fight. Like Mark Smith, I'm not aware that he's even there some of the times. It's like some of the best ref football games are the games with no pass interference is thrown. You know what I mean? Sometimes, right. not all the time, and sometimes you got to call it, but we all like sports when the ref is less involved. Like it's a fact. Nobody likes seeing free throw fest in basketball. No, we like free throwing transition basketball. Like, like nobody likes to see – Tonyoni literally grabbing fighters' hands and just and like it. slapping him off the fence. It, it was yeah. wild, wild. Hundred uh, percent. So in this fight, we had Charles Rosa, men's featherweight. Sorry, uh, Charles Rosa at minus one ninety is the favorite against Derek Minner at plus one sixty. Uh, yeah. Derek Minner, twenty three wins, twenty two submissions, twenty one submissions in the first round was his record coming in. That's badass. That's amazing. I mean, that is that's that's, that's an insane stat. That really, really is because at that point, it's no longer a mystery what you're try- going to try to do, and people still can't stop it. And that's that's whenever you're at that uh, that next level, right? And, well, what's crazy about that though is that in the bleed up to this fight, Charles Rose is a pretty like decorated black belt in jiu-jitsu himself, and he was like, "I'm not afraid to go to the ground. Like we can do that." Well, that's essentially exactly what happens in this fight, man. Yeah, uh, Minner got that takedown about 90 seconds into the first round. And then from there, it was just a jiu-jitsu scramble and battle the whole rest of the first round. It was sick. Yeah, it was sick to watch. I feel like from a strategy standpoint, 
Rosa put himself behind the eight ball. Be, and right. we talked about this a million times. And that's kind of how I broke down round one. So I give round one 10 9 minute, but it was so close, but it was close for a really weird reason. Um, so most of the round was spent with Minner on top of Rosa. However, Rosa was throwing up a million and a half submissions from his back. Saucy arm bars. And saucy and dangerous and getting close and causing I mean causing uh Minner a lot of problems with those with those kind of defensive submission attempts and um and that gets really hard to score, right? Like it gets really hard to score. It's murky. I mean, we're 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 taught and I think that like the actual judges are taught that the guy on top, I mean, essentially is winning. And I mean it's kind of uh but when a guy has such an active guard and it's so dangerous from his back, it just is so hard to score. Cause it's not like Rosa didn't want to be on his back. It like it wasn't like Minner was like essentially forcing him to be on his back. Like, I mean, he was very comfortable on his back to say the least. I'm not saying he preferred to be on his back, but he was down, he was down to be on his back and throw up submissions from his back. So it's not like when you're scoring like grapple control. But when one guy's kind of down to be in a position, it gets murky. But, yeah, continue. Well, I was just going to say as well, though, that Minner was passing guard, getting to full mount occasionally, would get arm triangles and head and arm chokes locked in. But Rosa just had great defense and would get his leg back under, get back into half guard, and then get back into full. Like, his defense was tremendous from the bottom, yeah. as much as his attack was. It's just being 100%. on bottom limits your ability sometimes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you can't score necessarily grab. So it's exactly what you said like, is like it's a super close round just because like that whole situation is that close. A hundred percent. But are we both in agreement? Did you give it ten nine? Minner Minner ten nine for me okay, on the first cool. for sure. Yeah, and yeah, then I sure. thought the second was pretty crazy because in the first fifteen seconds Minner came out and caught Rosa and had him rocked and like slid into full mount, but then. Rosa was able to survive and then threw up some even nastier arm bars and def defense from the bottom. Like his defense from the bottom was sick. And Bisping noted it, that Minner should have tried to stand back up with Rosa in the start of the second round because he had him hurt. And like, obviously yeah. in jujitsu, like he wasn't going to get him last night. Like clearly they were a good match. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, man. Um, and talking about also being murky. So it sounds to me like you didn't even consider 10 a for round two. No, I didn't just because Rosa was able to survive and then defend and then continue to attack back, even though he was on his back. Yeah. It was that same thing I, of like he kept it close. I feel you, man. I feel you, you might have just swayed me because I had a 10 8 question mark. Like I wasn't like sold on it, but it was a pretty because like on on face value, like on face value, men are men are like, did land good damage him, though. And then essentially was on top for the rest of the round. So like right. on, on surface level, like that seems like a dominant round but as we kind of the point we're trying to hammer home here is that you know R charles rosa's defensive jujitsu is so dangerous from his back that it's super hard to give men or credit for being on top whenever he's on top essentially defending like it's a, it's a crazy dynamic that's so, like so so i feel i think i think you kind of swayed me to 10 9 there to be completely honest um because you, you made a very valid point. I, I agree with what you said, man. So, but, but regardless, we have round still, one. Still men are winning both, yeah. So, yep. so 2018, and then uh, the third round, I felt like was just another a mirror image of the second and first, where Minner gets back on top and just controls from the top, survives the attacks from bottom, and wins the round out 10-9. So the only thing that made – I actually thought round three was the easiest round to score. and I'm Minner started points, landing but, ground and pound, too, though. And opened up that big cut. The damage, yes, the blood. Yes, the elbows at the very end. The elbow. So it was at the very end, but the fact that there was blood, like maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but I was like, okay, that's what I've been needing to see this whole time of like, like at that, at that point when he was landing those elbows and, and Rosa was bleeding, like it was no, it was at that, that was the most clear point of dominance to me in the whole fight. Like it became visually clear who was winning the fight by then. I needed that. I needed that. And like I said, maybe that's me. I think you know, people at uh, home, it was good too, because at the end of it, you see uh, Charles Rosa bleeding like that, and you're like, oh, okay, Minner won the fight. And it makes yeah. sense. But if you actually watched it, like, super technical fight down on the ground, that the blood but, really just came in the end. And I, and I think, and Bisping was saying this a lot last night, and I think it, it kind of illustrates this fight really well. Um, Bisping was just saying, like, 
like like all night he kept trying to hammer home the point that like submissions are dope as fuck if they work but if they don't work i mean kind of you know they, 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 it, it's kind of all or nothing like like mm-hmm. bisney was making it seem like he doesn't really value almost submitting somebody like at all like which like, i do I feel you, but it's it's a question. It's murky. It's it's it's. But for Bisping too, though, like he and he, I think he slightly admitted this, which I wish he would have owned up more to. His jiu-jitsu is not that good, yeah. so for him, it's not a position where he feels like he has an attack from. So he's using it to get back into his feet, where he feels comfortable, where he feels like he's in control of the fight. So I think that's personal. a personal style. Okay, no, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense, but uh. Well, and, and so so we essentially both scored at 30-27 um, for minute, and only one judge agreed with us. Um, one, one guy at 30-26, scored, which, which like is you were saying. Which is round two, I, right, I imagine. Right, I can see that. And then one judge actually scored uh, a round for Charles Rosa. It's 29-27, yes. but then and a 10-8. Yeah. So I don't – I guess the first for Charles yeah, Rosa? It, it, he had to give the first to Rosa, and then he had to give a, round two a 10-8 to Minner. That was like all that, over the that, place. Yeah, it was all over the place. But I think that illustrates just exactly what we're talking about because because we essentially spent a whole time splitting a bunch of hairs. But if you asked us who won the fight, we both oh, said Minner pretty quickly. So that's kind of what happened here with the judging. Like the judges' scorecards were all over the place, kind of like ours were. But at the end of the result, both of us and all three judges had Derek Minner winning. And he does cash as a plus-160 underdog in the unanimous decision. So that – interesting fight. Very interesting fight. Like you yeah. said, to a casual may have been, you know, a roll-your-eyes snoozer, but there's a lot going on there, and there was a lot to break down. That probably gave us more to actually break down than any other fight, maybe with the exception of Hazamava. But, yeah, a lot went on in that fight. There was a lot of nuanced, weird – things going on but uh yeah the right man won the fight minute gets the decision cashes as the underdog and we got two fights left my guy i'm gonna um, go get my dad rig real quick for sure uh so in the next fight we'll drop down 10 pounds and go to the women's side of things uh bantamweight 135 women's division uh nice little ranked matchup here for old rankings mcgee uh <laughs> number six ketlin vieira versus uh number seven yana kunitskaya uh, Vieira minus 280 and Kunitskaya plus 230. Uh, interesting that they noted on the broadcast, uh, Tiago Santos is Kunitskaya's fiance, which I was like really surprised to note. Tiago Santos, for anyone was wondering, 205, uh, Lama Heta, the just monster. Uh, yeah, I thought that was cool. And then Vieira missed weight by two pounds. Yeah, yeah, so, weird, weird amounts of missed weight by. Like it's, yeah, yeah, that's a number where usually they'd fight to get to it. So I was a little confused by that. Um, but this was essentially what everyone considered a fight where uh, it was a stand-up striker in the Russian Kunitskaya versus a uh, jiu-jitsu grappler in the Brazilian Caitlin Vieira. And that is essentially how it played out in the first round. Um, Vieira got the fight to the ground, got to full mount with like two minutes left, and didn't wasn't able to finish the fight. And Yana Kunitskaya actually... Um, Got back out of full mount, which was, like, technically really good. I was surprised by that. I was pretty yeah. impressed. Uh, but I still thought Vieira won that round 10-9 pretty clearly. Yes, I had round one 10-9 Vieira. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, a lot of clinch and grapple control, but not a lot of damage. Um, Almost but, no damage. I think she only threw four strikes or seven strikes. Yeah, which – I thought it came back to bite her. And this yeah, is another absolutely. super murky fight to judge. And a, ju- a fight where the final numbers were super misleading. Like, yeah, it, like it, a fight where this story was not told on paper whatsoever at all. Like, not, yeah. I mean, it, this was I a weird fight. This was, was a, a really super weird fight. Weird fight. Um, but so far, we're, we're in lockstep. 10 9 round one Vieira, the grapple, the clinch, but not a lot of damage. I think I think we're right. We're 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 on the same page there. But what was so weird was that round two was a literal reversal of round one, in which Kunitskaya got the takedown, got on yes, top, which nobody and, saw coming, it, and won the grappling exchange from the top. It was so wild. So I actually scored the second round ten nine for Kunitskaya for almost the exact same reasons that I scored it for Vieira, except that Kunitskaya was actually landing some ground and pound with it. 
Yeah, man, and it's going to be kind of splitting hairs because I gave them both 10 nines too, but I actually like Kunis Guy's 10 nine better because there was For more sure. compound of damage. It was so a, like it I, was a more strong 10 nine. It was like it was like a yeah, like a like a 10 8 <laughs> five. Or like yeah, I don't know, right. like, like yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, a, like we were like round all 10 nines nine. are not created equal. I guess is what I'm getting at. And uh, like I said, I thought I thought Kunis Guy's was more dangerous and more dominant. Also, yeah, did, we did mention rankings McGee six versus seven here. So, yeah, you know I like that. But um, And then so, so we have it tied one round to one round. I thought everybody agreed that it was tied one round to one round going into, going into round three. Absolutely. It seemed, it seemed now, fairly obvious. How did you score round three? Because round three is one of the murkiest rounds I've ever seen in my life. So, actually, you know what? I personally didn't find it to be that murky, and I feel pretty confident in how I scored it and the, the reasons why I scored it. I scored round three, Vieira 10 9, because she had me too. Guys back, That's like, so the crazy. The majority of the round, like the majority of the round, like I think yeah, literally yeah. three minutes of the round, she had her back. Uh, then I know now, this guy is punching her uh, like 70 times on the ground, but like. I mean, punching behind your head, yeah, like, that's it's not that great. It's like something like your little brother does to you when you like have him in a headlock. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're not it's like it's hurting you. It's just like, right. yeah, man. Um, I thought that was blatantly obvious. Now, but this is where, and they say the judges don't have access to the strike numbers, but I, I'm starting to like question that conspiracy tinfoil hat. <laughs> the, the only. The only argument to be made for Kunitskaya winning this decision, which, spoiler alert, she does, um, the only, like, literally the only argument to be made is the strike numbers. So um, Kunitskaya had 178 to, uh, to 16. So, like, whenever you hear those numbers. And that sounds like Hamzat Shemaev numbers. Like, you think, like, domination, like, fight got stopped, like, late in the second or early in the third from just a guy getting 10-8 at two, two rounds in a row. So, like, I know somewhere out there is a casual who didn't watch the fight and is just going to be like, oh, like, to 178 to 16, why die on that hill? Like, Kunitskaya clearly won. I'm no. telling you, dog. I don't think like, so. It's the most irrelevant statistic, like, I've ever seen in my life. How are total strikes irrelevant when you're talking about a fight? Like, sometimes it just is. It's like when that quarterback throws for 550 because the other team – was up by five touchdowns in the second quarter and you're coming from behind and they're in prevent defense. It's like, that's not the quarterback's best game, but he threw for 500 yards. Like that's what this was. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's the same as like, uh, I'm glad you said it that way because like in the fantasy scoring for fighting, like mixed martial arts, it's a lot of the scoring comes from significant strikes landed. Well, they don't count ground strikes as significant strikes in, in fantasy scoring. So it's like, so it's like if someone's a takedown machine and they do all their damage on the ground, ground and pound, those aren't significant, so you're not scoring points for them. So it's like, I don't know. It, it, that doesn't tell the story of how dominant they obviously were if they're destroying someone on the ground. Yeah, man, and it's just it's just super weird. It's super weird because Kuniskaya was an underdog, plus 230 underdog, but they were one ranking apart. I um, I mean, Kunitskaya, I mean, if we're putting on tinfoil hat, Kunitskaya is definitely more, like, marketable. I mean, she's a good-looking good looking young lady. Uh, Engaged to Tiago Santos, trains yeah, at ATT. Like, it seems to be, like, a team player, like, you know, with the UFC and all that. Um, Would be a more fun matchup against Nunes or the girls at the top. Yeah, man. So, it's like, I, I hate doing that. But I just, like I said, if, if you, like I said, you tell me the judges don't have access to the strike numbers, and they still give this fight to Kunitskaya? Because like I said, round one, close, but I don't think it's really debatable. Vieira, 10-9, round one. Right. Like, like, that's right. Not... Round two, Kun... now if it would have been some weird draw where they gave Kunitskaya 10-8 for round two. Or round three, I... like 10, or like round three, 10-10. Or nine nine, however they do a draw round. Like, like, like I would not be really dying on any hill. But I just don't understand. So Kunitskaya, round two, all day and Sunday, you know, like just like 10 times out of 10, Kunitskaya round two. Tied up, right? I mean, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, 19-19, yeah. 
And then Vieira proceeds to have Kuniskaya's back. And like I said, maybe somebody can, can fact check me and maybe I'm being dramatic. But what seems like three minutes of the round. That's about right, yeah. Vieira, Vieira has Kuniskaya. Now, I'll admit, while she has the back, she's not doing nearly enough with it. Like, and and not- Vieira was hurt at the end of the fight. Like in the last like 25 seconds, Kuniskaya opened up that huge, huge cut with the three elbows. They were just back to back to back after she reversed the guard. So, like, that was essentially, I think, this guy stole the round from the, from the so. judges. I think but so. I don't That's think the... that was a, like, I don't think it was enough Me to neither. steal the round. She weathered it. Like, I, I think, I think, no, I think it's fair to say, like, like, somebody can be saved by the bell and still win a round. Like, do you think yeah, that's a controversial sure, statement? Sure. No, 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 no. I think that makes I think sense. that's what happens. I think that's the best way to describe what we yeah. lost in the third round. Absolutely, but absolutely. Because judges... I wrote, if that fight goes 45 more seconds, Kunitskaya wins the round is what I wrote. And I don't disagree with that. But, like, you know, it didn't. Like, ifs and buts right, and there's the, and nuts, like, like, right. The rounds are five minutes. Like, there's, And there's three of them. Like, that's the contest. And if somebody has somebody's back for three of those five minutes, and you land two dope elbows in the last five seconds. Like, I don't think that necessarily, like, overcompensates or, like, you know, for, for the, dominance throughout four minutes almost of a round. So, yeah, man. Like, I'm with like you. I said, I mean, I, I guess I'll go ahead and make the official Hill to Die on stamp on this one. Because, like I said, <laughs> I, I, I don't even really feel like that I can be convinced otherwise. Like, certain times I'm like, oh, I think this person won. But, you know, I, I, I can see – like a logical defense of the other person winning, but in this, it, uh, like that's kind of how I felt about the um, Phil Hall fight. Like you know, Phil Hall right. could easily not won, but I'm not really gonna down the hill. Like it was a close fight. This one, I I don't really feel that way. Like, I feel like Kunitskaya lost two out of the three rounds in a three round fight. Like it's really kind of cut and dry. Super um, weird because I I thought when you very first introduced this that you were gonna say you scored it for Kunitskaya and that was gonna be the controversy. Because I scored it for Vieira, but then you did too. So it's we've been scoring everything the same recently in these in this card. So and, and another thing, I guess, important to note since we're kind of talking about controversial decisions here, um, all three judges scored it twenty nine twenty eight. Like it wasn't even like right, a, it was right. A it wasn't a split. Or, it wasn't a majority. It was a unanimous decision. Now, on the exact guy. same unanimous decision. Like I just yeah, I I don't understand how three people could watch that and get the same thing. Now if one judge would have saw it that way. Fine, not Fine. mad at it, split all day Even long. two, yeah. I would have said, was like, man, it's not a robbery because it's a split, but, like, it's as close as you get. But, this unanimous is a robbery, I feel like. I feel you. If I was Vieira, I'd be salty. Um, I, Yeah, I mean, I guess all you can do is Vieira. I mean, they're probably just going to swap rankings, right? I mean, you can't Something drop like her that. that much. Like, six drops to seven, seven jumps to six. I don't know. That's what I would do. So, you can't be too mad. Their paths may cross again in the future. Vieira puts a couple of wins together. She'll be just right. But, yeah, I thought I thought it was a robbery. I'll go ahead and say it. The, the, like, I, I, I've been trying not to stick my neck out there as much lately with the whole dying on hills. D-Max hills to die on. I'm, I'm doing it, man. Dying <laughs> on hills, man. That's what we're doing. And it, it is time for the main event. What and, uh, a main event, too. What a main event in, like, both just the actual fight and the context of the fight and the implications of the fight. Uh, and the real-life payout. A real life payout, yes. Yeah, so all these factors, but I, I want to. I thought I thought long and hard about how I want to kind of just dive into this. And the first thing I want to say is I want to actually. I know this is kind of a dick move. I want to criticize both fighters, not for what for, they did in the octagon, for for what they what they did for marketing this fight and for their what build they did up to their own careers. No, no, dead ass. And and and, and I'm kind of borrowing this take <laughs> from the Chelsea crab in a, the, the crab in a bucket shit. No, bro. Both of these men. So this was number two versus number four fighting heavyweight main event. Anybody in their right minds that's a fighter, a competitor, or even really covers the sport would go would have not be making a hot take by saying the winner of this fight is should be setting themselves up for a shot at the title. Like I think that's a very fair statement to make. And, and now I'm not obviously don't live under a rock. I obviously know that John Jones is coming to heavyweight, and right. that essentially they the UFC has said that John Jones is getting a title shot. Right. But I'm saying if I'm Lewis or Blades, what the fuck does that have to do with me? <laughs> it's a good point. 
I mean, but what, I, yeah, Blades I'm was super accepting of it. Blades was super three. accepting. Both. Lewis, too, which I'm shocked at. Lewis is known for opening his mouth and making, you know, statements. And I, he is known for being more funny than he is calling people out. But I was shocked. Like, the Blades shit, I kind of get it. He's kind of an understated guy, kind of a shy guy, has a speech impediment, not the most chest out, braggadocious guy. I, I get it. It's kind of his brand. He's kind of a shut up and dribble kind of guy, like you know what I'm right. saying. And like, right, uh, right, right, right. Uh, but but Lewis, the most <laughs> the like, most Jesus. outspoken, like doesn't give a fuck guy out there. Like 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 like, like honestly, he should have just been like fuck that. John Jones has never fought in this weight class. He's not even a heavyweight. He's never even stepped on the scale at anything bigger than 205. Like 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 like. like yeah, call it the credential to even have that access to that title. Well, yeah. Like how is he? I, especially a guy like Lewis, I've knocked out. He's 12 on a four-fight win streak. Yeah, I've knocked out twelve heavyweights. He hasn't knocked out one. Like, like, just there's you have like actual, not even just like braggadocious. Like, you have actual like kind of stats and shit you can point to, or be like, man, I'm I'm twice the size of that little toothpick, or just anything, right? You can just say anything and just reject the narrative that Jones is skipping you in line. Both Lewis and and Blades. Not only did they let John skip him in line, they shined his shoes and warmed his seat for him. It was like, here you go, sir. Please don't scare me and beat me up. Like, I just, I thought it was, I thought the whole, it, and, it, and, it, and it lessened how excited I could be for this fight. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they hurt yeah, their Yeah, that's own. a good point. It's a good like, point. I, I'm not trying to make the logical case here that they should get the title shot over John. I don't want people to get confused. That's not my argument. I'm saying that should I'm be Lewis theirs. or Blades, and I'm, it's my own career, and I'm hyping a fight. That's what you do, and and I just I felt very strongly about that. I really did. I wanted to kind of get that out of the way because if they would have hyped this fight correctly and said like "fuck John Jones," I'm a heavyweight. He's not. This fight could have like been more exciting. I mean, I don't know. It was already exciting. Don't get me wrong, but I just I thought they missed the opportunity. I felt like especially for Curtis Blades. Being ranked number two and needing, I mean, if he if he beats Lewis, who's ranked number four, and Ngannou's the guy getting the shot right now, how oh, how in the hell would Curtis Blades not get the next shot, or at least get to have to fight John Jones for that shot? Yes, yes, that's that's, that's and that's a money fight done. for those guys. That's a huge that's, money fight. Yes, like that's what I'm saying, bro. You don't you don't like you call out John Jones and say no, you don't get the title shot. You you haven't even got past yeah, like, yet. yeah, like, like you want it so bad, go through me because I deserve it. You think you deserve yeah. it? Let's see, let's find out. Yeah, you're you're trying to take what's mine. That's the like yeah, no. Like I said, Chill Chill did a deep dive on that, and I'd be remiss to not like you know shout it out because he's the one that kind of planted that seed in my mind. But then I, that seed grew, and I felt very strongly about it. Um, so yeah, even after the fight too, like the post fight call out was, was super soft. Yeah, I bro, I was going crazy. I felt a certain <laughs> type of way about that. Like I said, man, because I like I like Blade Lewis. No matter who would have won, I would have felt the same way. But they did they did themselves a disservice. Um, Absolutely, they really did. Um, but but all right, let's get into the actual nuts and bolts of this. Um, actually, I guess there's one more little precursor. So then. Uh, actually, we read the message that's on the screen. I can't even say I'm too far away. Who's commenting? Here? What's going on here? I uh, I can't see it. It doesn't have it. Doesn't doesn't load comments for me. Oh yeah, oh, it what? here it is. Here it is. Derek Lewis said, mm, "Lewis called out Overeem." Is what uh, that's. Oh like. okay. yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get to that. Which I, I was not a fan of at all. We call out, but um, uh, but yeah. So we have number. Uh, so. Before the fight, last night, uh, two nights ago, I guess the night, the night before the fight, I'm I'm texting Harrison, and uh, as I I was looking at the fight odds, and I just kind of out of curiosity, I didn't even really think I was gonna put any money down, but then I my eyes are scrolling, my eyes are scrolling, and I see Lewis plus three hundred, and I'm like, my jaw which, which like it kept dropped. going up too, by the yeah, way, it like kept by the time I stepped in the cage, he was plus three fifty, and. Now this was a one unit bet. I I did not. I, I obviously wasn't betting the farm on this, but I was like, if like first off, I asked myself the same two questions I asked earlier. I was like, who's gonna win this fight? And I was like, oh well, like Lewis easily could win this fight. Like I didn't say will or hundred percent will or bet the farm, but I was like, could Lewis win this fight? Fuck yeah, he could. 
Um, okay, and then how would he win it? Well, he's gonna if he wins, he's gonna win by knockout. Like, like it's not like he's gonna get a decision or a sub on him. So I was like, I was like, if he wins, it's gonna be by knockout. And then I saw the 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 number you could get like what plus four twenty or whatever it was. Plus, plus uh, four ten is yeah what it ended up. I think plus ending I got, it, yeah yeah I got plus four ten locked in um uh, for Lewis uh but Lewis by knockout and um uh, like I said so just that's a good way that you can approach fights. Like I said now if I was to have to bet the farm, I probably would have done it on Blades, but right. just a small. A small risk with a high upside on a guy like Derek Lewis with some of the nastiest hands in UFC history. I was willing to make that small risk, and like it was a small risk, but I I, I quadrupled my money. Right. Um, well, and he has uh, the most underdog victories in UFC heavyweight history. So wow, I didn't even know that. That would have made me feel even more confident. But yeah, yeah so you, I, it was, so you it take was that a into great account. number. And like you're talking about path to victory, like. That's how he wins a fight. He doesn't submit people. He's not the doctor stoppage, but still that's a TKO KO. Yeah, so exactly. Taking Lewis to win by KO TKO is like, that's the only way he could win the fight. So if you think exactly. he has any chance to win, you would just take that because it's a more specific take and you're going to get better odds for it. When in reality, why would you not take it? No, so exactly. yeah, I mean, 100%. good call by you. Whenever you brought those odds to my attention, the four to one, I was just, I was pretty, pretty, offset by those i was like i can't believe the disrespect and me that's too, honestly what i wrote like uh to start this fight like we can go ahead and dive into the breakdown but i felt like the odds were accurate but disrespectful and, and that just, sounds weird to say but i feel like if these guys fight 10 times well i well i don't know after seeing it but coming into it i, I had felt like if they had fought 10 times blades of win seven out of ten eight out of ten so I was like, yeah, these odds are like what would like be logical, but they're disrespectful to Derek Lewis and his ability to like one shot KO people. Exactly, bro. Exactly. Like, um, so Blades was the number two ranked heavyweight at minus four fifty favorite, and Derek Lewis was the number four ranked heavyweight, highly credentialed, legend in heavyweight, coming at a plus three fifty underdog. Um, and so because uh, I'm like a lot of you guys, or maybe not, but I watch a lot of MMA podcasts and talking heads and this and that. And I, I'm a big fan. Of, and, and, um, and everybody all week, all week was just, you know, blades wrestling, blades, blades wrestling, blades wrestling, which is a fact. He's probably the best wrestler in the heavyweight division. Um, however, I just, like I said, if, if they were welterweights fighting and, and blades had that much of a wrestling advantage, I would take it to the bank. But yeah, absolutely. The fact that these men are fighting at heavyweights, and it's not just heavyweights. There's like heavyweights, and then there's like Engano and Lewis are kind of like in another kind of punching, like dangerous category. You know, like um, like like they have Deontay Wilder level power, where like they'll put the touch of death on a guy, one shot. Doesn't even have to be their hardest shot. Like it could just no. be straight right down the middle, but they'll actually like put a guy out for minutes. So that's that's why I was kind of discounting the wrestling factor of Blades in this fight. Like, like I'm really not trying to toot my own horn, but like exactly what transpired was what I was saying that nobody was like, like I I saw that coming, bro. Like I I'm, 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 I rarely rarely do this. I mean, yeah, really, you, really you, you right, texted me like, about it, like, and you never yeah, do that. So like, yeah, when you just, when you did that, that's why I took it so seriously too, because I was like. Oh, D Max like, got a feeling. Like he's got this feeling. I was just like everybody was acting like Blades was just gonna be able to shoot at will. And I was like, shoot on Derek Lewis? <laughs> like, like have good luck, dog. And like, I don't know. I just like I said, I'm not even trying to shoot my own horn, but like I dead ass like when I'm I like I feel like most MMA fans, like whenever we're looking at next week's card, we kind of have like a little mini movie in our head of how we see the fight potentially transpiring, you know, especially when there's two fighters that we are very familiar with and know their backgrounds and we've seen them fight multiple times, like you have kind of a picture, like a simulation in Madden. When you simulate the game, like I kind of, and like when I was doing my simulation, I swear to God, I like knocked it out of the park. Like this is kind of how <laughs> like, I, was like, I was like, Blades is going to shoot in and probably eat a monster shot. Like I, but, but yeah, man, let's get to it, man. Round one. Yeah. So that's exactly what I was going to say. So round one, I uh, 
I actually scored it to Blades. Now, low activity for both guys, and you could tell that Lewis was just waiting for Blades to try and get into a grappling exchange, and you could tell Blades was trying to get him to strike with him so that he could shoot in. I, it was uh, like a yeah. real, like, real chess match, and at heavyweight, they have to play it like that because one shot can end the whole night and, if, and maybe affect your career moving forward. So no, you've got to play it very carefully at heavyweight. Now, I, like I said, scored it 10-9 to, to Blades. Um, there was a super bad eye poke by Blades at, at near the end of the round that Blades was like the most apologetic I've ever seen anyone be in a fight. Like he said, I'm sorry, like seven times in there. Yeah, he said, I'm sorry to one that wasn't even called an eye poke by Herb. Yeah. Herb was or like, that was, Herb. he was like, Herb was like, that was a slap on your face. Like that wasn't an eye poke, like <laughs> keep fighting. And Blades yeah. was like, all right, cool. And Derek yeah, Lewis, no, Derek like, Lewis is like bullshit, and just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no man, um, yeah man, and so uh, yeah, I also I had round one from Blades. He said pretty low activity, but Blades had the center of the octagon. He had the ring control for the most part. Um, but it was clear as day. Like like the more I watched the of round one, even though I gave round one to Blades, I felt more confident in my pick because you could it, see it being set up. I could see I it. Could I was too. like. Yeah, I was like, he's gonna wait till he shoots and fucking explode. The and fact that Blades saw... didn't get a takedown was like alarming. Like, if you I, were at bet I, money I... on Blades and you didn't see a takedown, you should have wrecked and been like, this is not good. Yeah, like if you're in fight wagering, you could have right. definitely seen the writing on the wall for sure. Um, well, and then I, I don't know if you saw Blades, like not the post fight interview, but like the longer, like the press conference one. Uh, Blades the, went to um, the press conference? No, no, but I, uh, Lewis, I apologize. Oh, Lewis. God. I was like, Lewis. are you serious? No, no. Lewis, Lewis afterwards was like saying essentially the same thing we're saying. He was like, after round one, when I saw he was like standing and trading with me, he was yeah, he's he, messing like, up. Lewis, he's messing Lewis up. Was, yeah, Lewis was saying to himself, he was like, oh, all right, this is like, you're messing up. Like, he's going to bite you in the ass. And sure is fucking up. Um, and yeah, man, round two, like I said, it almost felt like deja vu for me. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. Like, round two, I like it went down exactly how I pictured <laughs> it going down for like four or five days now. And it's like, so round one, they stood up, and like, it's a weird thing where Blades won the round in a lot of people's eyes, but he didn't really do any damage and he didn't really have much success. And he wasn't able to do what it is he wanted to do, which is you know, take, take, take Lewis down. And then so round two, it was, and it was cool. Everybody knew it. it was, everybody in the building knew he was going to come out and shoot. Like I, at least I felt like I did like, like he spent the whole it, he had one to, on right? Feet. At some point, like he had, like this man is the most takedowns in heavyweight history by a lot, like 23 yeah. takedowns. And the la the next closest guy isn't active anymore. So like he is going to like blow that record out of the water. So of course you, me, Analysts, Dana White, people at home all thought Curtis Blades has to get a takedown. Like, he has to get a takedown. Well, so did Derek Lewis think. He thought that, too. And yeah. apparently, whenever Derek Lewis had spent this whole camp just training for, <laughs> when he takes a sloppy shot, punish him. Well, that punishment came in the form of an uppercut in which, like, Dude, this is the most vicious shit, too, like, whenever you, like, watch it in slow-mo. Because the uppercut, the first one hits. That Blades is out. He's out. Right? The, the reason he falls backwards is because Derek Lewis catches his weight and uppercuts him again back into the ground. And then catches him with two of the fattest right hooks while his body's locked up out cold on the ground. Dude, and immediately... Immediately, this is my. I was laughing. This is four forty in the morning last night. I'm laughing hysterically in my room because fucking you hear uh, Curtis Blades' coach say something like, "You didn't have to hit him those extra times or something." <laughs> Derek Lewis immediately goes, "That Herb Dean fault. Tell Herb <laughs> Dean about it. It's not my job." And I was like, "Oh my god, dude! Like, just put a mic on this man for the rest of his life." And then like, did you hear what? It was also, he was like, he was in another in that post fight interview, he was. He was saying, like, well, you know, yeah, did you have to let him know the time? He was like, look, man, he could have put an undertaker yeah, and just stood up, up in the dead. <laughs> oh, man. You never know. Uh, it's, it's up to you. He was like, so the ref tells you to chill out. And you're like, all right. Yeah. He, definitely <laughs> didn't, he definitely didn't do anything wrong. Yeah, I definitely did. Like, it was stopped as soon as possible. Uh, like I said, if, if, you're, if you watch old UFC fights, that's how every fight ended. Um, just looked just like Bisping getting KO'd by Dan Henderson. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like, damn near the same. Funny that yeah, this man. was the commentator.
<laughs> PTSD flashbacks, but uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, man. So Lewis, like I said, it, it was like a donkey coming point. Like it literally kind of looked like dude. He like animated, he wound like, it up. Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Seriously, like like he was fucking doing like a crank in the fucking uh, like reeling in the water hose. You know, he got this big fucking thing. Just like boom, and it just landed. It was just perfect. It was a car crash. It was a fucking car yeah. crash, and. I said it just it just looked like something out of a video game, out of like an action movie. Just insert kind of bigger than life uppercut. Like it was like, so brutal. It was so brutal. Like I, like, I was freaking out. Uh, just because yeah, like I said, like I I I don't know, man. Like I don't have a lot of intuitions, or like I don't really like I said. But I swear to God, it was like deja vu. Like this is what I fucking saw happen, and like I didn't think it would actually would happen. But it it did like it was uh it was yeah it was, it was crazy it was like it was almost like I had seen it before man um and so yeah man we we cashed our bet uh, and then the next thing I was like fuck did Harrison actually put the money because like I said it to you and I'll be I'll be completely honest I was pretty drunk when I was texting you. and I was like <laughs> I, 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 I was like I was like fuck because like I w- I wouldn't even have been mad because it was like oh maybe maybe he didn't like maybe he did me a favor by not because I was a drunk asshole when I said that and nah. like. Uh, and then, uh, but no, you, and then he did, then he called me and you're like the bet cast. And I don't know. It was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, man, like I said, Derek Lewis is way too dangerous of a man to not risk a few bucks at pl- over plus 400 on like, seriously, like, he right. just, and like I said, if this fight would have been two welterweights, I wouldn't even have felt that way. But a man like Derek Lewis that had like the whole one punch back here at heavyweight is so real. And then Derek Lewis is like not just any average heavyweight. Like he takes that and you times it by ten with a guy like Derek Lewis. And I'm just like, I'll take my, I'll t- I, I, I just liked my shot. I liked my odds. I liked my chances. And you know, yeah. it, it, came, it came back. It came back good. Um, so obviously Derek Lewis was the last performance of the night. Bonus and obviously yeah. well deserved. Deservedly so. So now, now we got to talk ramifications and call outs and, and all that. Um, so we got um that's that gives him the most KOs in heavyweight history at twelve, which I mean in a division known for knockouts to have the most. Right. I mean that's yeah. that's heavyweight. epic. That yeah, that's that's so epic. That's that's amazing. Like can't sleep on that, can't overlook that. Um also want to just list off these names, and these are all guys Lewis has beaten in the UFC. Roy Nelson, Travis Brown, Marcin Tybura, Francis Ngannou, Volkov. Olenek and Blades. I mean, that's fucking impressive as a list. That's, that's a who's who. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, and, it's, and honestly, you know only what? like only like two or three losses in there. To well, go I was with about that. to say. I was about to say one of those losses. I think was to Mark Hunt, which Mark Hunt's a legend. But, and DC. Uh, DC's and DC. One that's what I'm saying. Like the people he's lost to, and then you can debatably say he's beaten like more dangerous. Like the win over Francis is like he beat the most dangerous well, who else man has on the that? planet. Stipe and him. Those are the only two dudes on the planet that have wins over Francis. So it's like I almost feel like the Francis win kind of cancels out the Mark Hunt loss in a way. Yeah, like, I, I would know, agree. I would weird agree. Weird MMA math, and uh, like I said, I just I I. I already put respect on Derek Lewis's name, and I think a lot of people did. But like I said, I think a lot more he, more people know him for the balls is hot quote than that know him for being an all time great heavyweight. And I, I think like, as much as I love the funny quotes and everything, as much as I love that, I just don't want to lose sight of the fact that he's not just like some corny one liners. He's legitimately one of the best heavyweights. Well, ever, and his ever. physique was like it looks way better in this fight. Like it looks like he's actually taking strength and conditioning seriously. And his wrestling looked good. He stuffed a takedown attempt from Blades in the yeah, second round yeah. to set up that that second shot. So yeah, I mean 100%. I, I think uh, Derek Lewis getting a little older, but like he might be right now in his prime. Like in the next 18 months, we might see the best we'll ever see of Derek Lewis. So yeah, I'm excited man, to see what the future holds. Now, like you were alluding to earlier, he did himself no favors and then doubled down in the press conference and called out Overeem for his next opponent, who is going to be like number 10. Yeah. So, yeah. And, 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 and like, it's one of those things where he wants, like, he respects Overeem. He wants to be Overeem's last fight. He wants to get a chance to fight him while he still has the chance. I don't, I don't think he's even trying to fool and, anybody that it's like a career move. 
And he said just, he doesn't want to be a main event with him. He wants to be a, a co-main or, or under. Because he doesn't want to fight five rounds. Yeah, that's just – it was such a weird call-out. <laughs> such a weird call-out. I I'm, wasn't a fan of it. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Lewis, and I'm not going to go that hard on him because I'm such a big fan of him. But – I already went real deep on the whole rolling out the red carpet for John Jones thing and how I feel about that. Um, not a fan of it at all. I, I, he a hundred and twenty thousand percent should have called out John Jones. Um, right. It, yeah. It, it, it would have made or, sense. Or the loser winner of Stipe in in Ghana. Like I think that would have made sense too. Any name that's that wasn't Jones and Gano or Stipe was was wrong. An out of line call. Out. Bisping tried to guide him into that. It was like out of those three guys, who would you want to fight? And he was like, I, I guess Stipe. And it was like, yeah, what the fuck is that? And then he goes in those actual press conference and is like, I want to fight over him. It's like, what the fuck? I think he yeah. just wants to show up, fight, get his win bonus if he wins, and go home. Like I don't think he fights for belts. I think he just fights to be paid. I, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and I mean, which good I, for him. I, I would definitely, you know, have, he would definitely be favored over over. You think? You think? I, I mean, Fuck I think. Yeah, yeah, coming off a win and over and coming off a loss, uh, and being you know, the big rankings gap. Yeah, I think he would definitely be. And favored. the way you've seen over him be knocked out in some of his fights, and the way that like damage hurts him, and the way that hurt, or the way that hooks and uppercuts can split through his high shell guard. It's a recipe for very big disaster. No, I feel it, man. Like, I don't even really want to watch that. Like, I don't want to watch it. It's not, like, yeah, I, it's I, not. Yeah. Yeah, man, I was, I was super disappointed. Like, usually, like, in a weird way, talking about the, the call-outs or what's next or the ramifications, usually that's, like, the funnest, damn near the funnest part of the yeah. breakdown. But just Lewis just shit all over that with that weak-ass call-out. And, I, I mean, like, yeah, like, and now Blades is coming off a loss, so it's like, who – like he's in a weird spot. Like Blades, do you think Blades? Get, do you think Blades gets the winner of Rosenstroy Gane? I mean, is that like? That's make what makes sense? sense. That's what makes the most sense to me. Yeah, yeah, for real. Uh, that's because because all right, Francis Stipe. That's in what like a month or two months or. Uh yeah, April I believe April. So, and then they're going to need, like, six more months at least, most likely longer if Stipe wow. wins. Wow. Well, if, it, yeah, that's what I was going to say. If Stipe wins, we'll be waiting nine months to see another fight. That's if Nganu wins, we might only wait three. Nganu actually no. is done to fight. Stipe yeah, needs great to quit point. with this bullshit. Yeah. He's holding up the goddamn division. That's what I'm saying. So, it's like, ah, uh, yeah, and then John, John, and then John coming in. It's just – it's weird. It's almost like those three guys are in their own division and then the rest of the heavyweights are in, like, like 6A2. You know what I'm saying? Right, like, yeah. Like, That's exactly like, right. Because, like it, – it, and then – but so is, is right now – right now Lewis has to be the best of the rest, right? Like it, the best yeah. out of the non and, and based Jones, on resume, Stephen, too. Gano. Based on resume, yeah. now that he's gotten blades out of his way, like – and he has a win over in Ganu. It's like, yeah, I mean, Derek Lewis has the best shot to be the next guy up besides John Jones. And that's why or to fight John Jones. It would make all the sense in the world right now for us to be talking about either Lewis versus Jones or Lewis versus the winner of Ghana Rosenstreich. And uh Or like a Lewis Jones fight in two months to see who gets the title shot against the winner of Nganu Stipe because Lewis took no damage last night. He could fight again yeah. soon. And Jones, like, he's going to have to fight soon. Like, I don't yeah, – we've given you know, him plenty of time to bulk. Like, it's 100%. been a year. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100%. But instead, Lewis calls out over him. And now – and then Blades is coming off a loss. So, I mean, Blades is still probably only going to drop to, like, what, three? Or, I mean, he's not going to drop far. Maybe he's going to Lewis at four. And, and so, like – yeah, and then so yeah, Blades versus the winner of Rosenstroy Gane. But I mean, that kind of goes against the precedent that they don't usually put a, a guy coming off a loss against a, a guy on the rise. But at, at that high end, I guess they could get away with it. I don't know, guys. Like I don't know, but it's just a lot less fun to talk about with that weak call out by Lewis. Like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, now absolutely. We're, now we're talking about Blades off a loss 
And kind of ruins the heavyweight out. tournament we had built. Yeah, I, it, it, it kind of shits on it because I mean, what Blades is going to need out at least six months off, right? At least like like maybe longer. Like that was vicious. I hope he takes at least six. If he tries to come back in like three months, just go ahead and bet against him. <laughs> no, I feel you. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, that's 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 solid advice. So then it's like. Yeah, like a, a young killer like Gane, say he beats Rose and Stroy. You think Gane wants to wait like nine months to fight again? So it's like, no. yeah, man, it's just the, these heavyweights fighting like so not often. And I get it that the consequences are so heavy for the heavyweights. I don't know. It's just it, it's interesting. Like I said, I'm a little annoyed with the with the John thing. Now I get John thinking he deserves to come into a title shot. I get it. If I was John, I'd feel the same way. But like I said, my biggest problem started even before the Blades Lewis fight, <clears throat> when both of those men conceded that John gets the next in line. I'll be real, man. I think. And if they both want to have that concession, then great. We'll just go ahead and give John next in line, and that'll make this all a lot easier. But what's hard about it is, is Stipe just holds this division hostage. He's got to let it go. Like, fighting DC three times in 30 months wasn't great, right? Because all these guys in the bottom were a shark tank just killing each other. Yeah. Then John Jones decides, I don't want to come up, and it's like, Stipe is like, all right, well, I got to fight this guy first. And the UFC is like, yeah, he's got to fight this guy first because Ngannou obviously deserves it. Yeah. But if Stipe takes a bunch of damage and somehow manages to win the fight again like he did the first time they fought, what's that mean? John waits nine months to fight for the belt? And he the, fight, John, takes two John, years in between fights? Like, John has They're to mismanaging fight the whole situation. Yeah, it, 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 including the fighters themselves. And then, and then like, watch, we're going to find ourselves in a scenario where, like, what if, what if before John even fights, Gane manages to beat Rosenstreich and, say, Blades? Just saying what if. I know that's a big what if. I mean, and with the wins he's been putting in and the streak he's on and the, and the career path he had before the UFC, like, probably he's in line, too. And then, but, but there's no way John's ego allows him to fight a name like Gane. Like, no, no way. Uh -huh, so No way. There's no chance. There's no chance. So it's like the integrity of the heavyweight match matchmaking between Stipe's inactivity and John Jones's insertion and Lewis's whack call out. That's like the holy trinity for like not having a division that makes any sense at all, you know? Right. Yeah. I agree with you. Like I those agree. three factors. It's like the perfect storm. Like, any one of those things, the division could have overcame. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. But, but in the but trifecta, all three it's at like the exact same time. It just it, we're kind of forces like, their like, hand. Yeah. Like, like, what do you do with the rest? I guess, like, I guess you know what they do with the rest. They make money. They do fight night. Just shark tank them. Like, just shark like tank them. Yeah. Lewis Overeem fight night. What, you just Blade, sell them to the masses, Shark Tank style. Blades gone a fight night. Blades Gone would be fun. That'd be fun. No, it's fun, but it just it's like. But it's it, like, what's it for? It doesn't yeah, give us it much, and it's not for them. For round. them, what's it? What's it for? Like yeah, they're not going like to get a title shot. Pay per views. Those well, yeah, they're going to say pay per views, and they're not going to get a title shot. So in between yeah. all that, like, what's it for? Yeah, like, are you doing like? Just you're just getting your pay. You're just, you're winning, you're showing, and... you're just your show and win. Like, and honestly, Derek Lewis is right. Now that I'm thinking about it, fuck a five-round fight. If I get paid the same for three rounds and five rounds and I'm not going to get a title shot, give me a three-round fight. Don't make me main event. I don't give a fuck about that. Just, I want to show up and get paid. Yeah, because he already has a name. Main events only really help a name. Like, like Gane is going to – if Gane wins this main event against Rosenstreich, that helps him a lot more right. than this fight night help Derek Lewis. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, no, makes a lot of sense, man, and – I said it was a great episode, great night of fights. Like I said, it kind of ends on like a dauber down, just because, like I said, the the lane call out and kind of the the weird kind of situation at heavyweight. But I mean, at the sick end of the day, KO, still, sick, sick, KO. sick night of fights, sick finishes, sick performances. I mean, a lot of fun. Still looking forward to next week. We got more fun next week. I know we talked about it, like you know a bunch already, but Rosenstreich, Gane. I mean, like I said, it was just. 
We were supposed to come out of these two weeks with so many answers, and instead we came out with so many questions, right? But isn't that how yeah, life like goes? like more problems than solutions? But I thought we had like a clear Grand Prix in order. I thought we had like a path to success. But maybe next week will give us something for it. Who knows? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, like I said, if if, if, if like if Gane started, because I I feel like if Rosenstroik beats Gane, like he's kind of supposed to, right? Like I don't feel like that, that that doesn't move the needle much either. And I'm not trying to. Maybe it does. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just I get the feeling that doesn't really. He, then you Rosenstruck, probably have, you probably do Rosenstroik Lewis if Rosenstroik wins because he's ranked yeah. number three. So yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And then. uh but I feel like if Ghana can beat Rosenstroik, I mean, I feel like hype train. I feel like – It'll be there. And then if he has the stones to make the dope call, like I said, I know John would never What if he calls him. out Lewis? If he calls out Lewis or Jones or just anybody, you know, like he needs to do what these other guys aren't doing. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. To fill the void because if no one's going to do it, someone has to. Stir the pot, fill the void, get your name elevated, get conversations started. You know that's that that's the name of the game, right? That's 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 how you're supposed to be going about this. But uh, but yeah, man, a lot of fun. Can't wait for next week, man. Thanks for yeah. everybody that watched on Facebook. Thanks for everybody that um go subscribe on YouTube, Beefy Boys Breakdown. Um, we also yeah, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter at Beefy Breakdown. Um, you know, go go watch fighters talk shit about our podcast. Uh, shout out to Jalen Lynn. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, man, just be a part of the journey. I think we still got a few more shirts left. If anybody wants one, DM me. Got some, probably smalls. some new merch coming to you soon. But, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Harrison. A lot of fun. Always, Another bro. episode 36 Always. in the book. Yes, sir. See you next week.